start by approving the minutes of June 12th and June 13th. So moved. And oh wait, does this, it, somebody need to record until Rose gets here? Yes. Ask me, I'll never get it. <laughs> I can't attach a document. Shoot, this pen doesn't work either. Uh, I can. Do you have one? Oh, this uh, is that. Okay. 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 okay, so Jordan moved and somebody second? Second. 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 Okay, Jamie. Jamie seconded. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. And we are now going to move on to signing a contract with Central Vermont Humane Society for boarding of animals when necessary. Um, have folks had a chance to look at this contract? I do. Okay. Any remarks? It seems appropriate. Is it kind of the same from year to year always? Or is this a new thing? It, it, it's pretty standard. Okay, you're very standard. standard. Okay, so it's not asked for town city authorized agent. Should I sign it? It's the same pricing as last year. Okay, this does not yet have Erica Holmes's signature on it. I'll get that back from her. Okay. And. So there's yeah. that. Yeah. Did, you yeah. hmm? Did you approve both sets of minutes, the site visit also? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We need a motion to authorize you to sign that. I'll make a motion to authorize Gabrielle. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> to, uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, you are? Okay. Okay. And so, can you second it, Angela? Second. Thank you. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Okay. And the next item is signing board orders, which I believe is in process. They're circulating, yeah. Okay. So next up, we have public comment, which technically starts at 6.05. So, um, and it's up to 15 minutes will be taken for public comment and time will be divided so that everyone has equal time to speak. Are there any folks here for public comment? Okay, hi. And sure, go for it. And uh, will you state your name? Reed Sherrington. Uh, oh, Jamie, we're neighbors. Do you think oh, I, sorry. I should distribute to the board what I sent you with my email? Sure. Since I just talked to you? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you, do you have copies? Yeah. Or you can just. Yeah. And we also need a copy for the minute taker, please. Do you have an yeah. extra copy? Yeah. And okay, great. Uh, this is about the, the bank out here. Just bugged me for a while, and uh, just um, uh, last couple of growing seasons, I've tried to keep it open with my um, uh, gas-powered uh, bladed trimmer. Um, We're talking about like right on the corner yeah, here, right? Right along the road on on this side. Okay. Everything else is beautiful. Ed Rowell does a wonderful job, um, but he can't get onto that bank with any of his equipment. Um, so I've I've been doing it not this year, but the last couple of years. Um, it's sort of a don't ask, don't tell way. <laughs> uh, but. I, yeah, I, I'm 80 now, so I'm not going to be able to do this too much longer. So I was hoping that, uh, that, that Jamie and, and Anne could arrange with the uh, road crew to use their uh, mounted on a hydraulic arm rotary mower. So on we that, can to get at it from below. Okay. And According to Ed Rowell's opinion, it should work just fine. Well, and for right now, that is, it's in serious disrepair. We have Don Hawkins reviewing it to see 
to try to put the boom lower back together so that it is safe. But they can get out there with actual um, handheld equipment and get the band cut. No, I, I wouldn't ask them to do that because they, I don't think a string trimmer is going to do it. Oh no, they've got some pretty heavy duty. Oh. I mean, they wouldn't want to do an entire roadway with it. They would be very unhappy, yeah. but they could probably do a bit. Okay. Well, we do have back straight tomorrow. If this, is, so. if this is done or two or three times a year, okay. I'd be. I mean, your job isn't to make me happy, but I'd be happy. <laughs> um, and uh, I just think it's a nice view of the building mm -hmm. from the road, and, and you don't really get that until you cross the brook, because the growth along the brook, which is good, um, so. The, the, town hall kind of bursts into view there mm -hmm. and I would hate to see that bank just grow up to trees which it will do if we don't keep after it. It will take a while but it will. Yeah, no, but it happens, yeah. So. And the easiest way to maintain it is this grass and if you want grass, real grass, mm -hmm. not burdocks, uh -huh. uh, you know, you've got to mow it, you know, at least three times a summer. Yeah, no, and unfortunately does it they were able to get some mowing done, but... Um, yeah. No, I, I saw along the Peking Book Road where they had been experimenting. <laughs> Try. You give it a go. Yes. Right. I'll just leave <laughs> But we can, they do have some powerful equipment because they are doing the long room 14 tomorrow, so I'll ask them about... This, I think that's doable. This, this uh, is not a grave issue. But I yeah, why do I, yeah. How many times a year do you do it? Uh, um, once or twice. Um, but I would do it more often if I wasn't so lazy. <laughs> well, thanks, Bree. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Anything else we need to know about this? I don't think so. I might tag quickly on that a public comment that I got from a resident today that's on the same topic. If that's okay. Somebody that's as crazy as <laughs> um, It was, uh, I was approached by Andrew Nemethy, who lives on Sparrow Road, which is a dead end off of um, Bliss Pond Road. And there's only two houses on it. And he mows the field and maintains the field on either side of the road. Um, and he mows it at specific times to control invasives and encourage pollinated plants. Um, and so he'd like to request that the town not mow the roadsides of Sparrow Road. And he said in the past the select board had had a very complicated form to make such requests and was just curious if we have a way that people are supposed to communicate those yeah. things to us. Um, Probably something that's going to take more discussion because I know historically it can be challenging for the crew to schedule when you know people here and there like different people want to vote or want to vote at this time or come down but don't come then it, it becomes very prohibitive when they kind of have blocks of times when they're able to do things with Sparrow Road I think it's safe to say they wouldn't touch it but I piggybacking on that I had a contact from Charlotte Bassett saying something about a, that there's a thing where you can ask to maintain your own road, basically. Um, but I don't know if that means you take complete responsibility, including winter maintenance. But it's probably gonna be a larger discussion. Mowing in general, if people are no mow, I think this season we're gonna be fine, because they're gonna be weed whacking, so. It's, you know, down your miles, I, I think Sparrow Road's safe from the mower this year, but. It seems like there might be two separate issues because this is the stretch that Reed's talking about. It sounds like it's part of the town hall property that adjoins the road that, you know, would fall under a kind of maintenance regimen that the town adopts relative to the town's property but these other ones are kind of more more relative to personal parcels and uh, practices on the rights of way in, diff yeah. in different areas so you know I think we could probably 
address them a little bit separately. I, I, I think <laughs> the Reed's topic is a little, uh, a little easier in some respects because that could just be a, a, a discussion right. about what, how to manage this particular parcel, but um, we, we may need to have a lengthier conversation about standard practices relative to yeah. uh, re re requests to deal with roadside mowing differently in different areas. I'm only aware of you know people wanting to perform the work themselves. I don't really know how that would necessarily apply for somebody re requesting not to do the work. Uh, that could that could get kind of complicated relative to safety and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And would we, we not want Ed Roll to do the thing that um, Reed has been doing? Well, Ed Rowell would do it, but he would be doing it as a road crew member, so it's still under the same umbrella. Even though he's under contract with the town? He's under contract as a road crew. Oh, I know it's complicated, okay. but he's always been paid as a road crew member. He doesn't have, have the equipment. The town has equipment. Yeah, so he has like a riding mode uh, right, that he you, uses for that. Right, you, but he can't But that heavy that. duty, yeah. Okay, but it's uncomplicated. We can request it or tell or again. I'll see him in the morning because we do have like a right of way um, side of view issue with Route 14 and Max Grade that they're taking care of. With Heat Trans tomorrow with the handheld feed record, so I can yeah they can take care of Reed's thing. Does it need it now, sure. Reed, or did you just well not right this second? But they can get to it. In the next no, that's why I'm yeah. asking if he did it like two weeks ago. They might not need to do it till the end of the summer. That's why I'm, you know, like I mean, I guess anybody can look at it and tell, no, but I just haven't. I don't know what you're doing. Okay. You haven't done it this year. No. Okay. All right. I, I uh, I'm sure I've seen my a lot of time, but I do have one other quick question, if I'm allowed. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, I I've just been reading in the minutes about. Uh, power lines on Leonard Road, and uh, I just want to confirm, I assume this is true, that the poles would not be in the travel part of the right-of-way, they would be on the side of the edge of the right-of-way, the way they are on many roads, yes. is that correct? So the reason I ask that is that I, th I think we, we need to think in terms of you know, maybe 200 years from now, that right of way might become a through road, and uh, we wouldn't want poles going down the middle of it. That's all. No, I mean I believe the poles are actually not on Leonard Road because Leonard Road kind of goes up, and his curb cut is currently below Leonard Road, yeah. so to speak. So I, I think it's going to be. So this this wet request is actually on the agenda. It's yes. Going to be going to be coming up and you can look at the details when, when you get there. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, and so for do you feel resolved enough about um, Andrew Nemethy's request that you can just get back to him and tell him we need to have further discussion because uh, it's complicated? Yes. Okay. Um, any other public comment before we move on? I just have one thing. Sure. My name is Bill Davis. Um, the light out here in the parking lot is on all the time. And if you look at both sides of this building, you can see that that side has bugs all over it. This side does not. So that side has to be cleaned because to keep the, the bugs out of it. What would, would you be interested in, in making that light a motion sensitive light so it only comes on when people are here? I think John's already called Washington Electric. Oh, he has? Yeah. We're working on it. Oh, good. Problem <laughs> solved. Well, nice. I, I clean here, so I see these things, and then I get John involved. So we are aware of the bugs. Um, and I think John set the porch lights so they would go off and not be on all night. So we're kind of working on it. <laughs> and Bill, thank you for your email about this. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. That was easy. Uh, let's see. So, um, any other public comment? All right, we'll move on to meeting our new CVRPC Executive Director, Christian Meyer. Hi. Hi. Thank you. 
Uh, Christian Meyer, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. Um, been in the position a lot longer than you all. Um, grew up down the road, so I know Cal as well. Um, but I want to kind of introduce myself, kind of reintroduce some of the services that the Regional Planning Commission offers the communities in our region. Uh, we're 23 municipalities, Washington County, plus several in Orange County. Um, we, uh, our mission, I'll make sure I get it right, our mission is to assist the member municipalities in providing effective local government to work cooperatively with them to address regional issues. To me, what that means is we're kind of, uh, we're a tool, you can pull out of the toolbox when you need us, and when we're done, you can put us back into the lawn. Um, you can add a little extra capacity when, when a municipality or community needs it, um, but, then you, but then we can, uh, we can disappear when we're, we're done. Of course, we're, ne we're never fully gone. Uh, we do become invested in the projects, which makes us uh, a beneficial partner. Um, kind of having another set of eyes up looking out for, for your town. Um, in addition to that, we kind of uh, aggregate local issues and try to make sure the state's aware of them. And similarly, work on, work on implementation of uh, state policies at the municipal level, so helping give guidance uh, as new policies are are effective. Um, some of the work we do is uh, transportation, uh, flood, uh, water quality and flood, storm water management, uh, energy and climate, hazard mitigation, land use and municipal planning needs, uh, regional planning obviously across municipal borders, economic development, ongoing legislation and other technical assistance as needed. Um, some of the direct assistance we've offered municipalities, both globally and to the region, uh, include uh, support of developing municipal plans. We worked with uh, our neighbors over in Woodbury on their recent plan, which was recognized by the Vermont Planning Association. Um, educational programs, we recently held a Planning 101 course that was a technical attended, uh, I imagine, even by some, some Cal the Cal's Planning Commission. Uh, local hazard mitigation plans, we can support that work or serve as your contractor. Obviously grant writing, uh, we've helped a number of municipalities uh, successfully achieve you know, some local grants like the municipal planning grant for uh, planning issues here, here, you might have here in your community. Uh, we can also serve as administ ed to help administer those programs, um, working with your consultant uh, as needed. We also all have GIS services uh, mapping uh, that is often a popular request, uh, both from community members and uh, select boards. Um, we can set up shared services. Uh, we're enabled under state statute to do things like a shared planner, shared zoning administrator, something like that. We currently have no, no, um, no town is taking us up on that, but it's beginning to catch on across the state. So, especially in smaller communities, that make the opportunities down the road. Uh, so specific projects we worked on here in Calus, North Calus uh, Village designation. Helping with that, recently formatting zoning ordinances. Uh, we'll be working with Callis on, we're the administrator for the, the, the culvert pro project out here, design project on, uh, uh, on Aikenbrook? Kent Hill Road. Kent Hill Road, yeah. but over Aikenbrook. Yeah? yeah. Um, what else we have? Oh yes, yeah, so and we're working with the post office on the stormwater management, best management practice. Big project pro program that's coming along is a municipal uh, energy resilience program to uh, help make public buildings more energy efficient. Obviously, Calus has some that are in pretty good shape, but if it's a town garage or something like that, um, there's opportunities there. If she hasn't, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you'll hear from St. Lash, our energy plan. Um, Non-regulatory stormwater, uh, you're already doing the work at the post office in East Cows, but there's other opportunities, and uh, there's a strong focus on phosphorus mitigation for this uh, that program, but it can, can serve other benefits. Um, I think the uh, last two things will be new FEMA maps coming out, and for our region, probably around 2025, uh, we're already working, uh, looking at Cows zoning regulations to see how those can easily be updated to integrate new maps. And finally, uh, the bridge and culvert inventories. Calus is in need of a new one, and it's on our list for this summer. So hopefully, we will have you a new bridge and culvert inventory by the end of the year. We can keep our interns busy. I think you're doing some traffic studies for us, too. We are doing some traffic studies for you as well. That's right. Yeah. And um, so, thank you.
Um, I have a question. Is it time for questions? <laughs> I have a question about shared services. So you mentioned planning. What else is envisioned in the? Well, it's it's wherever there's a need between two municipalities. So some of the examples we've seen through the state are like I said, zoning administrators, um, assessors, shared assessors across uh, multiple municipalities. The the framework is. The individual becomes employed through the RBC, but each municipality is kind of able to buy a section of their time. Maybe it's 15 hours, 20 hours, and once you kind of hit that tipping point of having enough municipalities interested, we could go forward with that. Do you have a fact sheet on that? I do not have a fact sheet on that. Is there any kind of like preset information that if you know a town wanted to wrap its head around how can, it might be? I can pull I can pull that information from other regions who've already gone down this road. So you do have CBRPC folks that are, or towns that are using it? No. No, yeah. OK, not This yet. hasn't been implemented in our region yet, but it is taking place in uh, several other different <clears throat> regions across the state. OK, and, you, and you, you already have the capacity in place to, like, if Callis, East Montpelier, and Plainfield, yeah, Marshfield come to you or something? We hire for that position. OK. Yeah. Got it. All right. Yeah, that's great. And um, generally, we're here if ever you have an idea. I'm not sure how to execute it. We can pull from either our other community's experience or internally our experience. Um, OK, any other questions? <coughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Excuse me, I may not stay to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you are just staying up late. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the next item is a CB Fiber update from David Healy. So David is not going to make it. He um, was exposed to COVID over the weekend, so he's okay. having a quarantine. <clears throat> you got his update, which you can review, and we'll simply reschedule his presentation maybe in two weeks or the next time you meet, whenever it can fit on the agenda and he's available. But I do want to let you know that he has scheduled two workshops for Callis residents on the startup of CD Fiber. Um, you'll be seeing David will be posting these to Front Porch Forum, we'll be putting these around town and so forth. So Tuesday and Thursday, July 18th and 27th from 537 here at the town hall. And you can, he's just going to give people an overview about what CD Fiber is, why you should subscribe, how you can connect, how much does it cost, and what do you get for that. So watch the information on that forthcoming, and we'll reschedule him another night. Is he putting that in front porch forum, or is he asking? No, he'll, put it, he'll post it to front porch forum. Um, I'll get it posted around have hard copies around town. Okay, and I'm just curious. Does anybody know? Does anybody have CB fiber yet? As it's, it's not live yet. Okay, that's what I thought. You also left some handouts here. Yeah, I did. I did read it. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't remember. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. Well, thanks for that update, Barbara. Um, okay, I guess we're on to road issues, and we are ahead of schedule, which is amazing. So, don't say it too loud. what's that? Don't say it too loud. Okay, I take it back. We're late. We're late. Um, okay, so road issues. Uh, let's see. Well, it says report from road crew or road commissioner. Are we expecting road crew um, folks? To I come? wrote up a thing and set it out this morning, but I can read it to you what's been done. We you married. wrote up a thing, you sent it to our select board emails. And it's also in your Google It's folder. in the folder. And that it is. This so is the you mean this is the Larry Orr information? George Rose Red Way application. So I didn't get anything from you this morning. Okay. So you see in our calendar. It came from the select board administrator. It's the Larry Orr current remediation yeah. document. Oh okay. I do have that. So they went out on the 14th and 15th. On the 14th, they spread 30 hay bales, erosion mat on that section that was kind of where the previous curb cut was kind of cut off and it became a steep bank. Um, hand spread, one bag of conservation seed, 
along Leonard Road, you know, the class four piece that goes up, and then um, in the V section. The next day they did spread 84 pound to three inch plant mix, rocks. Um, and it's good because it rained really hard in the section. You know, Larry's curb cut that did not have it became very, very messy. So the rocks actually provided a good foundation and they sent pictures, which I will probably send from my personal email to you to send because I'm not grooving with the outlook yet. Um, but it looks good. The grass is growing. The, the bank is stable. I mean, the rocks laid a really great foundation and the hope is, and that came into just under, and most of it was for the rocks, the cost, $3,890 between labor, use of the equipment, and the materials that they used. The hope is to wait until after he gets all the large vehicles out of there to do anything more, but it is um, sufficient now that it shouldn't have any further damage. And then we did put Leonard Road and George Road as it curves down as part of the road grant segment that the state helps compensate us for the ditching and because it's part of the water management. Um, so yeah, they're hoping to hold off until his major stuff is done so that they can actually bring the road back down to, because it got kind of wider, obviously, from the... So he will not be built yet? He, his uh, basement is being put in in August. No, build, oh, B -I -L -L -E. build. I You could probably build it for this section, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, it but it's not, it should be considered 100% done. There may need to be further touch-ups after. Yeah, it may just be less painful for all involved if he's, if he's billed a, a few times mm -hmm. rather than one time. That makes sense. Uh, was anybody able to do anything on the downhill side to stabilizing the material that was like pushed down the embankment, whether or not there was any? Uh, yeah, well. so there is sufficient vegetation um, that that is going to capture where the water is, that there is sufficient that it's going to capture anything that, that goes down before it gets to the water. So they didn't do um, a silt fence. Okay. But they do go back like weekly and check and you know make sure that it's holding up. But it looked really good and like I said, I can forward those pictures in a roundabout way so you can see its current progress. But it looks good. So Well that's encouraging. Yes it is. And he's done very well with not touching it anymore. <coughs> no longer trying to help. We're doing well. So. Okay. Um are we sorry. No, uh, good. no, I was just saying thanks, Ann. Are we ready to move on to the um, or application for a new curb cut? I have some questions about this. Do you guys need to take a vote on what to do next? Um, and uh, a couple of questions would be, one, does Mr. Orr, has he received this? Does he know this is coming? Um, I have not gone over that with him yet. Okay, no. so this is news to him. Yes, okay. and I can go over, he wasn't there, you know, they did go by today to take pictures and he wasn't there, but I, yeah, probably they can reach it out to Larry, so he's not. It is not news to him that he is going to be billed for extensive work that had to be done by the town road crew. I'm sorry, say that again? It is not news to him that he oh, was oh, going right, to be right. billed. But this figures is what I meant. Mm -hmm. So, I'm wondering if you guys need to take, an act, take a vote on what the next action will be, and before you make that motion, if you're going to, would the town accept a payment plan from him? Or does, is he expected to pay it in full within 10 days or 30 days? Or what would be the expectation? I think you guys need to discuss for a motion. What's our next meeting? Uh, July 10th. That sounds about right, but I don't think yeah. Oh. yeah, I think it's July 10th. Um, I, I guess I would propose Considering, you know, we want to be sensitive not to, not to make any illusions that uh, that the work is final. That we should probably 
uh, have a conversation with Larry and whether or not he would have a preference to be billed incrementally um, or uh, at the completion. Um, we can certainly forward him a copy of work performed um, and maybe stop short of making that a, a bill until, until he's done. I don't know. I mean, once he starts incurring lots of building costs, doesn't that make it less likely that he would be able to pay this? I mean, it, it's, is it customary to give a, the billy a choice of when they're billed? It can go either way. I mean, it... it we could be regroup and take this conversation at our next meeting and I can talk to him and feel it out. And, because I agree it should be like an indefinite and it is a cost to the town and materials and things so we do want to make that. Sounds good. Okay. I'm okay with that. Yeah, good with I'd it? say let's, yeah. either way, let's plan on taking action, I guess, uh, the next at the next okay. meeting. Um, and he can know that so he can, yeah. Yeah, we can definitely show <laughs> share share the costs to date and let them know that there's a plan to perform the rest of the work when activity is subsided and equipment's moved out to a certain extent. <clears throat> and either way, we can take action on on the next at the next meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, on to WEC application for placement of utility poles in the town right of way on George and Leonard roads. Both the Callis Road crew and Callis Tree Warden have reviewed the application and made comments. So, a possible action is condition and sign permit allowing WEC to place poles in the right of way. This one. Oh, no. <laughs> Are we still on the first one? Yeah, that's all good. Okay, so the um, new curb cut application on Leonard Road. The Callis Road crew has viewed the application, and the possible action will be to approve and sign the curb, curb cut application. So. Um, this is a little different because as we all know, he already did the work and then we um, instructed him to do, uh, to get approval. So there's no details about the curb cut on here. What are you looking at? I am looking at notice of approval to proceed to construct. Oh, that, that's the permit. Okay. You need to look at the application to get oh, yeah. the Okay. That's the permit oh, yes. that, you, uh, that you will sign if you approve it. Got it. Um, yeah, there's still not really a lot of information on it, but um, do people feel ready to sign this thing? I, mean, I feel like we did a site visit and most of us seemed to agree it was actually a better curb cut location than this one. Does it have specifications about how they would want it to be, like, the sides and up the new way? Uh, three, it's just all it says detail-wise, other than this map, is um, 325 feet from corner of George Road. Has the proposed curb cut been clearly marked, staked, and flagged? Yes. And yes, we've all seen it. Yes, we think it's better. <laughs> So it's just a matter of like, so directions, restrictions, and conditions, no, it doesn't say anything. I mean, okay, but is that something that we want to as far as clean up of the side hill so there's not, that the, the new curb cut is left tidy? Yeah. I mean, is it possible that perhaps we can go back with that and have the guys really specify again very clearly what the end curb cut should look like? Um, because I think they kind of approach it like it's already been done. But I know that they, you know, wanted to have the the site cleaned up and mm -hmm. yeah, that's what's most of that laid out in the 
the original turf cut. Or, or the rest of the road work that the road crew's helping with? Except for they haven't been touching. So the, the steep side of his new curb cut, yeah. that is large, there's a lot of vegetation, so erosion's gonna be, but there was a fair amount of things cast off over there, um, which aesthetically, you know, can kind of impact. Uh, yeah, I guess I would, I would prefer that uh, the road crew go or somebody go, or like John, go over specifically to take a look at the car. I mean, I know that we're okay with the location, but relative to scoping out we had all the, the, details before the stabilization the of the uh, of the previous location, and then the only other thing that is kind of a question for me is the location of the culvert that was that's going to need to be that's going to need to be like replaced or pulled out and we'll need to that'll be in the town right of way um so we we would need to specify in this curb cut you know specifically whether or not we wanted larry to replace that culvert uh with something more specific in size and material um and I don't, I don't think that that was specifically noted. So, you know, I think we can tentatively agree that the location is better, but I think that the road crew will have to go out and take a look at some of the other kind of tertiary conditions related to uh, where, where that culvert is and have a conversation with, with Larry on whether or not they want us or the road crew to perform that installation or those modifications in, as included in the scope of work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, he's going to have to do it and he'll have to do it to the road crew satisfaction and we'll open that whole door again. So it seems like at least one more conversation is worth having with, with Larry about that. And I would also um, ask the question, was there a previous curb cut application? I don't think there was. Yes. So we did a curb cut application when we went on that visit where the hill went up and then had that, that was where his original curb cut was. So that's how he had access his land and below was a logging landing site. But didn't the, that original curb cut already exist? So, but you're saying he had a permit to do? So he's been working on it for over a series of, they're only good for a couple of years or one year, I don't know the exact time frame. So it, it was in process for quite a long time, but the most recent one I did have where the original went up and down and that's where you cut the bank off and yeah. made it a straight shot. So is this something I can give to Ann Tulin to pass to the road crew for them to fill it? Or you don't, I guess you don't need the piece of paper that- I know, but we should the take the map and just, just because I think it would benefit there to have a very, very specific, you know, we've talked about it a lot with yeah. this current curb cut as far as what the end result should look like um, and to that culvert because I don't think it fits under the, I think it's outside of the segment, but it's right at the edge of his curb cut. And it's definitely too short. I mean, that's one that he would replace with the one that's currently getting crushed and about 10, 15 feet too short. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the original. Do I give you the original, or do you just we have it in the, I the still folder? Need a copy. So, so yeah, e either that or you have it on email. Oh, I have you it and the road crew yep. got it on email back on June the first. Okay, I believe. So you can either rely on that, or that's my only town office copy. Yeah, no, we can use it on the one that we've got. You sure? Okay, so let me know if you can't part. find it. I'll send it to you again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I apologize for that. They probably were thinking like it's already been done. So no, no problem. That's great. They're that, focusing on the other things. Yeah. Um, okay. So that so that will have to go on the next agenda for uh, finalizing it, signing it. Okay. So I think now we're on to the WAC application for polls on George Road. Um. Let's see. Um. The application will involve cutting roughly 10 to 15 shade trees in the George Road right of way and maybe eight in the Leonard Road right of way. WEC is <coughs> exempt from having to follow the removal process in the shade tree plan. 
I recommend, and this is uh, Neil Neil Maker, right? This is Neil Maker, yeah. mm -hmm. our um, tree Heather warden. Forrester, tree warden. That the application be approved with the condition that WEC take care not to spread invasive honeysuckles. There are a number of honeysuckles growing under the proposed line between the existing pole. Machinery should be kept away from these when possible. And he says, I would also encourage WEC to remove any larger ash trees in the right of way, even if they don't need to be removed for wire clearance. Specifically, there are three larger white ash joined at the base in the southern right of way, uh, which will pose a hazard to the lines and the road when emerald ash borers kill them. So let's see. So what do we need to do for this possible action condition? And sign permit allowing WEC to place poles in the right of way. So I think the conditions should be as the tree warden mm -hmm. prescribed. And let's see, has everybody seen the map of what they're talking about? Does everybody have the information they need? Uh, yep. Um, all right, so let's see, Barbara, where's the, where's the thing to sign? So the yellow piece of paper is what you signed in Washington Electric Co-op. Okay. So if the select board would like to make a motion to authorize Gabrielle to sign it, I, I can, tomorrow morning before I mail that back to Washington Electric Co-op, I can write in the, I can add the attachment on Neil Maker's conditions if you guys agree with those conditions. People good with the yeah. tree how warden? Many, how many poles does it say? Uh, let's see. How many poles? Uh, in, the, in the right of way? There's another sheet from... It would be on the yellow sheet. Yeah. It's okay. Uh... Yeah, that's, that's just... Yeah, I don't, I don't, stuff. I can't, I don't see where it says how many holes. Um, so... Yeah. Okay, are we ready to make a motion? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll move to accept the WEC application relative to the conditions specified by the tree warden. And authorize Gabrielle to sign it. And I authorize Gabrielle to sign it. Thank you. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, and um, am I signing the thing that says permit holder? Yeah. Uh, well, no, permit holder. I, I, don't, I don't have the form in front of me. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. This, so I, does it need three signatures? If it's, there's three it's, lines. It's asking for three, then. Okay. Sorry. It's hard to read it while I'm talking. Dated act. Okay, and both copies? Yes, one's our copy and one's their copy. Yeah, already. There's not. Okay, great. Thank you. That's that one. Um, and uh, let's see, Beaver Control on Kent Hill Road. Do we want to wait on this one since oh, we've had Toby's, have here, now. Toby's, Toby's here. here? Okay. All right, so let's talk about beaver control on Kent Hill Road. The beavers are busy. <laughs> uh, they created a, a dam by the uh, substation entrance. <clears throat> the town crew took it down uh, about a week or four or five days ago, and it's been rebuilt. They've also plugged the culvert that feeds that side of the road. So. Um, I've talked with the state beaver specialist, um, and he doesn't think that a beaver baffle actually will work because of the level of the water. It's too shallow. Um, 
So <clears throat> I'm not sure what the options are. I would recommend that the road crew unplug the culvert at the very least and what we do about the dam. We can take it out again, but within four or five days they'll they'll do they'll rebuild the dam again. So it's gonna be a continuing problem. Yeah. Um, I spoke to the game board guest in so sort of say if I'm pronouncing his name correctly today about the ongoing issue with too when they go to do that large project, they'll have to drain it even further. Um, which will kind of negate the beaver's habitat. But beavers are unable to be relocated because the state is beaver locked. It's the same thing with bears, like you can't take a beaver and put it in a new place and hope it's gonna be fine. So I think unfortunately, pragmatically, and I'll say it, that the beavers are not going to work well in their current situation. Will probably need to be removed in a humane fashion. And that is what the game warden also said. It's probably the best path. So there is a trapping season, but I don't know if there's a nuisance beaver where they can actually do it outside of the trapping season. The trapping yes. Season is not the same. If you speak to the game warden, he said, "Yeah, we can do what we need to do for those particular." beavers and do the mineral rights to do so. <clears throat> Peter was out there today unplugging it again. Yeah, I, I remember him saying something about the, the season, doing it during the season, um, but it didn't sound like it was, uh, it was a requirement, just that maybe we, could consider it, although, oh yeah, let's say it would be preferred to have the beavers trapped during the regulated trapping season. Um, so yeah, it would be preferred, but I don't think we can wait until um, October. Well, unless you want to there every five days. No, I think we should do what we need to do to make sure the road doesn't so, yeah. deteriorate. Yes. I've been given several suggestions. I would just prefer whoever can do it in the humanest, quick kill fashion, not to be crass, but so I have several things that I can. Yeah. On. We worked with a guy from Barry who was great. Okay. Yeah. That name too. I don't have to remember his name, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll work on that. What was his name? Peter Flood. Yes. Yeah, he was and really good. Someone did spawn failure, but it's unfortunate. It may become an issue too on Gray Road, which we can tackle later. But that's also where both sides are kind of getting. And I would add that Ann Winchester spoke with the landowners, and they are all in favor of doing what is um, necessary to keep the road in good condition. On so, so the, uh, no, on Kendall Road. Okay, good. Uh, Tyler Brown, the state um, specialist, said we could put up what's known as an exclusion fence on the side of the culvert so they don't block the culvert anymore. So that would be require some 4x4, four 6x6 four, six six wire fencing that would go around and be staked in so they couldn't get to the entrance of the culvert. Um, <clears throat> just taking the dam down is not going to stop them from plugging the culvert. So that would actually work to prevent future culvert blocking. Um, again, once we take the dam out again and see what the water levels are, maybe there we could install a new beaver baffle. He just said that they get used to figuring out where it's, where it's leaking and they'll figure out a way to deal with it because the water is so shallow. Mm. So it, you know, it could be a temporary fix for a period of time, but Elimination of the beavers is really the only solution at this point. Yeah. Okay. Is that it for beaver control on Ken Hill Road? Mm -hmm. I think that is what we need to know, so yes. Okay, great. So we're on to Callis Trails Committee. I, yes. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. So does a vote need to be taken on what action's happening, or are you just giving instructions to Toby and Ann? I think I don't, I don't think we need a vote. vote on. It's okay. within our right of way, and it's okay. I just wanted to be clear. Road safety. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. It's just not, yeah, maybe it makes people uncomfortable, so it's good to have a conversation about it. But 
Um, and I guess, uh, Anne Winchester, if you are in touch with the landowner, could you maybe circle back with them that we had this conversation and that uh, the next step is likely trapping? Sure. Okay. I can thanks. do that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a Toby a question, I guess? Uh, and I guess, Anne, um, sounds like beaver activity along the roadsides is going to be kind of a uh, a, re a recurring issue. They seem to be fairly active uh, this year, and which would, and multiplying, which uh, I am not opposed to. Uh, but um, the uh, uh, the state representative Ty was it Tyler. Tyler. Yeah, Tyler uh, had mentioned two outside resources, uh, like kind of consults for other stuff. And I'm just wondering if, if you thought it'd be worthwhile maybe I bringing somebody exactly, in. I can contact both and just see if they have another solution. I think, you know, essentially I've done a lot of research over the years. Yeah. And I think it's important. So essentially putting up exclusion fencing or beaver baffles usually can work. It just depends on the location itself. And right now the beaver baffles doesn't appear to be an answer to the, the dam side of the, of the culvert. Yeah, I was just thinking more more comprehensively uh, whether it'd be worth uh, bringing somebody in to uh, just talk about whatever new techniques there are just in general to kind of equip us, equip us with other other options. Um, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say develop a beaver policy, beaver policy. but like I think uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it sounds like the beaver baffles have been evolving um, a, a little bit, and um, if, if you think it'd be worthwhile to maybe bring in somebody just to look yeah. more comprehensively at, at the issues, just to, so we have more solutions in our quiver, I guess. Um, but if you don't think that that's necessary, I, you know, no, I'll reach out because you know I've done some research, and most of the other. Solutions are very similar to that. Yeah, like sure. Essentially putting a hole in the dam that they can't go up. So they can't figure it out. But they can't figure it out. And yeah. Unfortunately, they're pretty smart. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. We're not smarter than they're in that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and as you say, um, there are a couple of towns in Vermont that do have a beaver policy, and I'll yeah. send that to you. Essentially, it's just a statement saying that if we have nuisance beavers on the infrastructure, then this is the steps that we take as a community so that it becomes a standardized approach. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good to I'll take a look at for sure. Too. All right. Uh, Callis Trails Committee. We have, uh, is Tom Blatchley yep. here? Hi, Tom. Hi. Um, he will give an overview of the Trails Committee work, and then I think we have some uh, possible appointments. Sure. You want me to just stand up here or no? I'm Tom Blatchley. I'm chair of the Trails Committee. I took over the chairmanship from Reed Charrington a few years back, who was longtime chair. Uh, we're a 10 member committee appointed by the select board. And um, we administer about 17 miles of trails in the town of Cowboys. Um, includes uh, quite a, an extensive uh, network of trails on the western side of town, which are uh, uh, long standing over in Robinson, uh, Robinson Hill and environs. And then we have a couple of uh, other big networks on the east side of town one off of Max Gray Road, the Butterfield Bridges, and then another one in the northeast corner of the town Broadview Farm Trail Network, and a few other uh, smaller trails um, in town. And we're always looking for new ones, so we're actively uh, you know, seeking out landowners who would like to dedicate their, their uh, land to these trails. I think we have a, a pretty good relationship with all our landowners. I think there's about 16 landowners in total. And what we do is it's it's pretty, it's completely driven by the landowners. Whatever they want to do, we do. Uh, 
in terms of where the trails are located, how they're maintained, what kind of use they get, um, and we work with them if there's any problems that develop. Every year we send out a, a landowner permission form for them to sign. Uh, it's not really a legal contract so much as just a, a recognition of what the relationship is like. Uh, they're in the catbird seat entirely. We give them every right to back out of the deal at any time for any reason or no reason at all. So far, nobody's backed out while I've been chair. Um, but, um, uh, you know, we're, we're um, uh, you know, really trying to get and, uh, the town to just uh, accept these trails and that uh, it's a great use of people's land to give back something to the community. There's no financial remuneration, but we find that the landowners seem to really uh, appreciate opening up their lands for this purpose. And um, I have some maps of our trails to hand out. If you'd like to see those, we have a mapping subcommittee, which consists of myself and Peter Lewiditis and Walter Olszewski, who is here. And he's been the primary map maker. He's uh, uh, put all of these maps into a consistent format and um, which we think are easy to read and easy to use and I have them all here and I think well, you know there's one folder per trail network so okay well, I want one of each space um, yeah. those if you wish <laughs> and um, I guess that's pretty much it I can't think of anything else do you have a budget we do <laughs> we do where does it come from um, where does it come from? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> One of those little obscure funds in the town. It comes from an obscure fund. It's, it's yeah. a part of the general, town's general fund voted on at town meeting each yeah. year. Do you know what, what is it this year? Oh, well, we, we, we don't well, have a well, for you. amount each year. It's more like a total available Funds or something like thirty-five hundred. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That so that's about money. typical. Yeah, yeah. Page, page thirty-five. Fifty-one. Fifty-one. Yeah. 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 So it, mo it mostly carries over? What's that? It mostly carries over? It mostly carries over. Uh, I can't think of any major expenses we've had recently. Um, you know, every now and then I dip into it to pay for blazes or paint for the blazes or, mm -hmm. you know, screws for the screw gun. <laughs> but very little. Um, and and the, the trails are... I mean, most of the trails are really maintained by the owners, uh, and they like to do that. That's, that's part of what they like about the trails, is being able to maintain it themselves. So every now and then, I need a work party, I'll put it out, and we'll go out with chainsaws and you know, fuck up some blowdowns or do some clipping and brushing and stuff like that. But mostly, uh, the landowners take care of it themselves, and it works pretty well. What about e-bikes? What's the what about what? E bikes? Um, good question. I don't know if we ever to deal with that yet. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, that is probably one of the major issues we get involved in is what kinds of use can these trails be put to. And we leave it up to the landowner. Again, we put them in the you know Catford seat, whatever they want. Some landowners are very clear. They just want foot traffic. Uh, some are okay with mountain bikes, um, skiing, cross country skiing, snowshoeing, stuff like that. Uh, some people don't like horseback riding. Some people do. You know, it depends on the trail and what their capacity of the trail is. Um, so and we try to address that with signage and also um, on our on the web on the, on the town's website, which has in addition to these maps, trails description, trail descriptions of all the trails, 
can find the video that they're on, on the uh, website. And on there also we list the kinds of uses that, that the trails can be. Yeah. They're on the town website? Yeah, well they're, they're on a, uh, if you go to the town website, there's a, a link to the trails team from the main website. Mm -hmm. And are you fully, um, I mean, I know we're going to appoint Patrick, but are you um, otherwise you're full up with members? You're all good? Yeah. Uh, That's we, a popular we, <laughs> we crew. Are, huh? uh, so, right, we had Michael Fullerton retire this year. He was a longstanding member of the committee, and we needed to find a replacement, and Patrick showed up, <laughs> and we met with him at our last meeting, and we think he'd be a great addition to the committee. There are two other openings that uh, the members want to be reappointed to another three-year term, and that's um, Denise Wilder and Tony Kading. I am neighbors with the Kadings. So they're in Callis, not Worcester? Uh, they live, I think they live in Worcester, but they have property in both towns. I think they claim residence in Worcester, because uh, they have two houses. In two houses. Okay. <laughs> At least one of them is <laughs> It's a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's actually a resident of Worcester, but she's yeah, on our trails. It's never been, been a, an, issue. an issue. She's a great um, addition to the Yeah, she's, she's great. I see her on our trails yeah, all the time. Yeah, she's our secretary, and really, she's very active. Mm -hmm. um, okay, but like residency is not required. I yes, that's no, never been one. Maybe don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's but. not my part. Okay. The All right. The board talked about it way back when it was okay for her, so. Yeah. Um, tell me dating exception. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Come in here. Just a big thanks to you all. The trails are wonderful. Callus has an incredible thing in our trail network and if people haven't gone hiking or biking or exploring on them, you should. Yeah. yeah so big thanks to you all. Yeah, there's some news to me in this stack of maps you gave out. Thanks for bringing maps, by the way. There are some. I've never been to the Bliss Pond Town Forest. Yeah. I don't think. It's I very, haven't very been to Broadview. That's a great one. Yeah. Actually, the Trails Committee doesn't do this one. Um, forest trail, it's right? a bit of a hybrid thing. Mm -hmm. we, we certainly help out, and um, if there's any maintenance, it needs to be done. We, but it's, it's really the conservation mission that basically maintains it. One, th one thing I'd like to throw in here, if I may, is that um, uh, well, East Montpelier has a, a different type of trail system, and they've raised some serious money, and they actually own trail right of ways. Um, I don't know in every instance, but you know, a lot of them. And um, that's something that the Callis Trails Committee has sort of thought would maybe would in the future be something to pursue seriously. But, but we're talking a different kind of. <laughs> Um, no, that just people aren't in general aren't going to be donating trail easements. Um, one landowner did um, mm -hmm. donate one to the right. Vermont Land Trust. The right. we, yeah. we have the privilege. The Cal Trails Committee has the privilege of administering it. Is that Longmeadow? It's on your land. Figured. <laughs> I didn't know it, but as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, sounds familiar. <laughs> they apparently didn't bring it up at the closing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what so are the practical that, ramifications of that for like a landowner? <laughs> um, the, well, he's, here, he's basically, uh, unless there's malfeasance on the part of the trails committee or whoever is administering the trail right of way. The landowner has given up uh, the rights, of the, the right of, what would you call it? Your land. Well, the rights to use the land. Yeah, yeah it's uh, yeah. Land, giving up land use yeah. Like, yeah. For, for that particular yeah. easement, I would imagine. Right. So it's something, it's something so. to us possibly aspire to, but that would have to be 
anything like that would have to be accepted by the select board. And ex yeah, right. And accepted by the landowner. I mean, it's always a little dance between the landowners and the committee because you know, we would like to see a lot of use of these strategies, okay. but we also respect the landowners primarily, and we're doing this. I feel primarily for them and for their whatever they want is where we go with this. Um, I don't know if this is the proper time to bring this up, but the Chapin Town Forest is something that's been on my mind for years. And there was a concerted effort a few years ago to try to um, develop a trail system in there. And the select board went out and had a site visit, and Alfie went out there and checked out the access. And the momentum was really building for this. And um, I went out and surveyed a whole trail out there. It's an incredible piece of land if you've never been out there. Very, very unique. And uh, I don't know, it, it's quite beautiful. Um, there was some landowners, there were, there were some landowners who had some concerns, but um, I don't think they were insurmountable. And um, anyway, um, it would be interesting to revisit that at some time. Um, I took Eric Sorensen out there, who's a naturalist who lives in town, and he did have some concerns about some of the rare plants that are in there. But he, he didn't say it was, um, you know, an insurmountable problem. It was just a question of working with, you know, using, using best practices to really make sure that we didn't damage these rare. I think there's some ferns and where is it? Where is the Chapin Town Forest? Mm -hmm. So the Chapin Town Forest, yeah, a lot of people know about it. It's off, so it's it's off of Chapin Road, which runs off of Lightning Ridge Road, mm -hmm. and 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 so this is another thing is that the, the Chapin Road actually runs all the way down Pekin Brook mm -hmm. Road, but half of it is a Class Three road. And there's, there's a lot of houses along that part. And then half of it is a class four road, which has some washouts in it that are pretty severe. I mean, my lar larger dream is of, is of having a trail along the class four portion of Chapin Road. And at the bottom on Pekin Brook, there's already a really nice little turn off that you could use as an access. And then from there, you could also access a loop trail through the Chapin Town Forest. It's owned by the town. So it really has a lot of potential to get developed. Uh, but um, it feels like the momentum was there, and then it just kind of stopped. And I think it, it anyway, just, just my own little pet project. I would love to see it in the conversation get started. Did, didn't the town put um, a parking lot in there last year? Um, they designated uh, a spot, and we figured we could get three or four cars in there comfortably. Um, so I don't know if they did any actual work up there, um, but there was certainly talk about it with the with the road commissioner, and it felt like everybody was on board. Did it but really get get approved? It might have had an actual formal approval from the site board. I don't think it know. did. Yeah. Anyway, that's just my little thing. And <laughs> do with it what you will, but I'd love to see that. Could I throw out a kind of a consideration, maybe, for the, um, for the committee? Um, I think a interim step of, of maybe putting together uh, a usage uh, and maintenance policy for the trail system that just kind of qualifies that, you know, this is a resource. That'd be very much kind of like how it's positioned on, on the town website, you know, as a community resource at the generosity of private owners, but maybe gets a little more detailed about what, um, what the expectations are for community usage and for maintenance and, and kind of bring that back. I think that would be kind of a nice progression of the conversation and kind of get us a little bit closer to organizing thoughts around a formal trail system proposal. Um, 
it, it, it doesn't seem like it hurts generally to have those things kind of qualified in, <laughs> in somewhere. Um, certainly if there is any any issue um, or, or grievance, you know, at least at least there's something there that says this is what the town and the landowners expectations are for usage. But um, uh, but also, I think, you know, can be beneficial for conversations with like Eric, where we say, you know, this is what we think these trails should be used or how they should be used or for, uh, uh, for what usages and kind of get ahead of the conversation a little bit yeah. with with defining whether e-bikes are acceptable. It just it, it starts as I think is a, as a nice incremental sure. um, step toward defining what that could be. Um, are you saying for the whole trail? network or I think so yeah cars? no I, I think for the whole trail network you know I think it's great that the individual trails you know have very specific usages that are for for the time being relative to the interests of the land landowners and and what they're comfortable with I, I'm not proposing that that should change but right. you know something that kind of more broadly defines where people can find that information and and yeah. that there are differences, but you know, I think that could also help in re-engaging the conversation about the Chapin Town Forest as yeah. well. There right. is um, there is some material on the website um, that we might use as sort of a starting place for that. But I'd be happy to work with the board to yeah. beef that up and be more specific about what we're doing. What are those? Uh, well, cool. Thank you. I, I mean, I think it's it's awesome work. So thank, thank you. you. We enjoy it. <laughs> Just one more thing before we close on this, because I think it's important. Um, I don't think we have any trails that are on class four roads, un untraveled roads, and and um, one of the reasons for that is that uh, we require the approval of abutting landowners even on a class four road and uh, we've made a couple of attempts <coughs> and turned down uh, so just because it's a class four road and we have a right to be there we don't sponsor trails unless we have land on, a bunny, uh, consent of a bunny landowners because uh, there was a lot of fear about uh, yeah. trails going where they weren't wanted and that would be true if it was a legal trail as well because it could yeah, be downgraded to a trail. Yeah, the town doesn't have any legal trails, I don't think. But if it did, it would have the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that could be an impediment, but it would still be great to get the conversation going on. Uh, okay. Okay, so I think I'm looking for a motion to appoint Patrick O'Donnell to a three-year term expiring 2026. And can we do the reappointment in the same motion of Tony Caging and Denise Wilder? Uh, so moved. And, and, and Tony Caging. Uh, Tony Caging and, Den and Denise Wilder, yeah. Thank you. Second. Okay, uh, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right. That one, and thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Declaration of Inclusion, Steve Owens. Hi. Come on up, or be there, whichever you want. So, um, I was um, a principal at Northeast Kingdom at some several schools for several years, and uh, such I read Barton Chronicle. And I encountered um, uh, a debate in Derby on the front page of the Chronicle about something called the Vermont Declaration of Inclusion. And so out of curiosity, I, I investigated their website, found out what it was. It looked like a worthy thing. And I looked at the map, and I discovered that the um, town of Callis um, uh, hasn't uh, adopted the Declaration of Inclusion. And it struck me, perhaps, um, the reason for that might simply be that um, nobody had asked. And so I brought it to Jamie's attention, and she put it on to the, um, uh, the agenda here. And um, uh, I 
So I'm, I guess I'm here simply to uh, initiate the process to ask. Uh, I'll say that um, uh, 112 municipalities have signed on to this, representing uh, nearly two thirds of the population of the state. Right now, Callis is the only one of the five towns in the U32 school district uh, which has not yet um, adopted the declaration. So, so this is the, the declaration in its entirety is on yeah, the. And whoever uh, prepared the agenda kind of inserted the Callis town name into the into the uh, declaration. I guess I'd further say that the uh, my read on it as a former school administrator is that uh, um, once adopted, it doesn't uh, uh, obligate us to we'll say implementation steps that are suggested on the website. Uh, rather, uh, those will be subject to um, to separate action if the, if the board so shows. <coughs> Okay. Um, have folks had a chance to read the declaration? Does anybody have any? I just, as a mother of non-white children, were we to adopt this, we would have to do the work because we're definitely not there. So, you know, are we going to change how we approach things? Are we going to? Is everyone going to be literally treated equally when we say everyone's welcome to live here? That doesn't just mean in East Palace Village. You know what I mean? Are we going to promote? <sighs> well, I mean, have the other four towns done uh, changed how they do everything? Just... I don't know. I just I, I struggle with lip service, and we're going to look. We signed this declaration, and we're going to continue on the same way we always have. I grew up in Montpelier, and it's the most classist place I've ever known. So I just it's up. It's a stickler with me, so I'm not adverse to it. I just I don't I don't want to be that place that's like we're doing it, and then we totally don't do it. But we try to about that we do it if we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's why it's very carefully worded as a declaration <laughs> as opposed to a you know series of actions. Um, and I don't mean that in a demeaning way. Go. Yeah, Steve, you know, may I ask Steve? Did I hear you saying that this website that's on the agenda, you can go, we can go to that and look at implementation steps? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a there are suggestions for implementation. Uh, you know, and I agree. Uh, you know, that uh, uh, without actions, um, you know, it is just lip service, but it's a first step. One of the things that occurred to me would be that if the town, say, uh, adopted a regulation of some sort that. Uh, was going to be a barrier to people fully you know, participating in the community. This would provide a lens to, uh, to critique that action uh, you know, prior to taking it. So, uh, as I said, there's no obligation in adopting this to do any of the steps that are suggested. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a, a matter of separate action for the uh, uh, for the select board. And what are some of the steps to the folks who have looked at the website? Oh, uh, for example, it could be uh, anything from uh, putting a framed copy of it in the town office, all the way to having um, you know DEI trainings for your uh, for your municipal uh, workforce, your police, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's a whole um, you know range from very uh, easy to implement, low hanging fruit, all the way to things that would be more more complicated and bear expense, but uh, on the other hand, also might um, move the needle, who knows? And they have, like, Montpelier has gone and made changes so that they actively try to recruit people from different backgrounds, whether people from lower socioeconomic status, people with disabilities, people from other minority groups that might not traditionally participate in um, committees, because, you know, typically it's certain people from a certain particular group and I've actually gone as far as creating like stipends to, so people have to get childcare or whatever. So they're trying to make it more accessible so people can participate. There's things like that, but. So, some towns would create a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And that committee would sort of be tasked at looking at various actions the select board takes or the you know adoption of new zoning regulations 
um, or other town policies to, to really look at and make sure that they don't have unintended adverse effects on certain populations. Certain populations that don't live in the town but might move to the town or certain populations that are in the town? Maybe both. both. Either or. Um, so what are people thinking about this? Do we need more time to think about it? Do we want to look at the steps and see what steps are feasible versus just doing the low-hanging fruit of hanging it in the town hall? Um, I would be in strong favor of adopting it and then keeping the conversation going at future meetings um, and, and sort of working through together over time how we can implement different pieces of it, but I think uh, passing it tonight would be a, a good first step to get the ball rolling. All right, is that a motion to? Are you guys ready to vote on the motion? Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. I just, uh -huh. I, yeah, I don't want to be that white person. No. Yes, yeah. you can pass it. You know, I, th I think this is a really important conversation to be had um, with, uh, within the, the community. And I do think that uh, adopting uh, the declaration is, is an important first, first step. Um, some mindful conversation, I think, has to be had around the, the next steps, particularly when you talk about creating committees. Um, on, on kind of both both sides of the coin, um, uh, but it's but it's the first step, and I'd I'd be really interested to see where that conversation goes. So I would make a motion uh, that the town uh, adopts the the declaration uh, of inclusion as as presented, uh, and would include in that, that as a first step, we should have that declaration printed and displayed in the uh, town office. Printed and displayed? Yeah. I'll second. second that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not too. <laughs> okay, so Jamie, second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. All right. And thank you for bringing up the distinction between having a declaration and actually doing something about it. <laughs> 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 yes. um, Do you good all vote the affirmative? Yes. We did. Yes. Okay. I think we're doing pretty not so bad on this schedule. Thank you for bringing in, Steve. Yeah, okay. thanks. Do you still have Albany? No, I retired. Oh. I, I did bargain and I remember too when I retired. Oh my gosh. But uh, I appreciate your points. But uh, I might just add one thing. In my experience as a small administrator, um, a lot of our diversity in the state is invisible. And marginalized people suffer enormously. Those people came through my office doors all the time. And so, um, you know, starting as a starting place, yeah, but your plan is really well taken. If we had a DEI committee of some sort, would you be interested in participating? Looks like I just volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Noted. All right. Um, Purs Pond Raft. The town auditor, the town auditor or the treasurer? Auditor recommends that we open an account specifically to receive funds being raised privately to go toward the purchase of a new raft to for the Curtis Pond swim area as authorized by the select board on June 12th. So possible action is authorized the treasurer to open a separate swim program bank account for the purpose of receiving contributions raised in a GoFundMe campaign to help pay for a new raft to be managed by the swim committee. Barbara, do you know why it would make sense to just use the existing swim committee? Um, 
I guess they don't have a separate account. They're just part of the They right. have a separate account that they use as their operating fund. But when, when Sandra was asked, can we just do it this way? She said, let me check with the auditor. And she, and she did. And he did, that basically said, definitely open up a separate account for a GoFundMe. And would we close so, that account after the raft is purchased? I, I, you don't know. I don't really okay. know. I just know that, that Sam, when Sandra was asked about this, she wanted to get the advice from the auditor. Yeah, yeah. And I do know that that's what he said. But what his reasoning is, I couldn't tell you the underlying purpose. I'd make a motion to authorize uh, Sandra to open a separate banking account for the swimming program specifically for the purpose of receiving GoFundMe, fa uh, GoFundMe funds or other private funds uh, raised relative to replacing the raft. And to close it if she sees fit um, after it's served its purpose. I'll second that. And what after it served its purpose? Uh, close the account in the event it's served its purpose and should be closed. And Jamie seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. All right, that's that one. So the townwide public vote on 2023 proposed zoning amendments. Um, on June 12th, we talked about tentative, we approved tentative dates. It turns out those dates were um, not great and instead um, we're proposing August or we can propose August 1st. Or are there multiple dates we wanna propose or just no, August 1st? We're, we're trying, we're pushing for August the 1st. Okay. So, um, so the motion would be to approve August 1st as a date for the vote and um, sign the warning. Do we need a vote to, yeah, oh, we need to rescind. Okay, so the motion is to, would be to rescind the June 12th vote on those other dates and approve a new date for August 1st and sign the warning. And, and so I'll just add that if you guys do that tonight and you sign the warning, then there's a Board of Civil Authority meeting tomorrow night for them to also approve this date. If for any reason they walk at what you guys approved tonight, we'll have to start all over again. So come to the BCA tomorrow night and everybody vote for this. And that is available as a Zoom meeting, right? That's a, that, that is a yeah. hybrid Zoom. So if it only takes in, five minutes. Come, come to the town office not here okay. or via zoom yeah. and i'll send out the zoom link again tomorrow morning but we can't do it in person you want we could come in person yeah yes okay. to, the town office. Office. Okay. to the town office okay yes it's at six yes but there's an emergency meeting at okay. seven okay. got it before the other emergency meeting the emergency management meeting that's on so that's Thursday. On Thursday when we have the special guest, but the regular scheduled meeting is Tuesday. Oh, okay. So, so I, but I do want to make sure that all of you did really re read that warning. The select board owns the warning. So I just want to be sure everybody read it and you're good with that before you sign it. 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. And how do people get a ballot if they don't want to wait until August 1st? We will not be mailing ballots to everybody. And so we will post every week to Front Porch Forum with instructions of either call, call or email the town office to request a ballot to be mailed to you in advance or show up at the polls on August the 1st. Okay. Um, there's one little extra underscore in the text of it, but I don't think that needs to be corrected. It's just okay, just if, if, it. if there's an underscore? Yeah, it's just a little okay, random. Okay, I can just it out. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, anybody making that motion? The one that I said before. <laughs> I will make that motion. Okay. Is there Did a Did Rose get it? 
Yes, I will second it. All except that. who was going to make it. <laughs> now I put your name on it. Oh, the motion was to rescind, to rescind the June 12th vote and approve August 1st as the new date. And to sign the warning. And, and to sign the, the warning, yes. And it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? All in fo favor, say aye. 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 Okay. May I have one more thing? Yes. That I learned just today. I checked in with the Secretary of State's Elections Division office to see if what information we need to submit to them around this public vote. And the answer is nothing. But in my few email exchanges with the Director of Elections, he informed me that this will require another public hearing. And I said, even though the Planning Commission held a public hearing on May the 2nd, and the Select Board held a public hearing on June the 12th, and he said, yes, once you've declared the elections, they're all called elections, public vote, it now requires another public hearing. So we we'd just be expecting that that will be forthcoming. Wow. And they're deep. I'm well, sure exactly. there's rules about when that it, has I think to it be. has to be within 10 days of the election or something. I, I, I've got it at the town office. I don't have all the details here. I think well, it has to be warned 20 days before the election. I'm not positive. But we'll follow all the guidelines and do it legally. So it's funny that I wonder if they realize that that's an incentive to actually not put it to a vote. You know what I mean? It's a disincentive because it's just I, too much work. I'm just looking at the calendar and August 1st is only five weeks away. I know. I know. Should, should we try to find a date tonight? Does that need a... Well, it can be before a select board, a select meeting. board meeting. You've got, you've probably right. got, you've probably got two dates in, in July already that would both be acceptable. Uh, July 10th and July 24th. Yeah. Or 26th. Or 26th. No. But I, I will have to double check and see if the 26th. I, I think that works, but I'll have to check on the legality of that. It's the 24th, Barbara. 24th. All right. Um, Okay, so it'll likely be the before the select board on the 10th or 24th. We'll, okay. we'll know by the end of this week. So Lister salary. Um, the previous select board increased the wages allocated for Listers from 8,000 in FY23 to 12,000 in FY24 in order to increase the hourly rate. So a possible action, and I, I guess the thing is that there is not necessarily an official record that they approved it. We couldn't find it. And, okay. and, and the discussion with them was that it would go from $20 an hour to $22 an hour. Okay. And so that $12,000 is per lister or total? No, that's per total. total. Okay. Um, all right. Does anybody want to make a motion to increase the hourly pay rate for listers effective July 1, 2023? Does anybody else want to offer any commentary on this? Or? I'm the one that brought it up because my husband's a listener. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's what's written in the town report that was approved at the right. meeting, right? I, I, I didn't think it needed to be voted on, but Sandra said yes. To, so should, Sandra, the treasurer, has asked that the, this new select board please vote on it. I mean, you'll see the twelve thousand dollars. I don't know if it said twenty. I don't think it specifically said twenty-two dollars an hour. No, it doesn't. But I know from, from Jack yeah, that, that was the reasoning. That, that's what that's she gave to the old select board. The uh, the March Senate approved a a, a bill that listers all need specific certification, and just being elected lister doesn't make you a lister state came right out and said it um, that you have to have a certificate that shows that you've taken so much coursework each year so if nothing else this bumping up the lister pay that a lot of that money is going to go to attending training hmm. unless the lister well, would the town pay for that training but they also well that's what this is i mean they get paid i guess it depends what pot you're pulling the money out of but it's 
it's more hours for the listeners, but it's also more expense for the town. We're basically doing the state's work for them, and they're watching over our shoulders. But does the town want the state to do that work for the town? Just do, doing a little devil's advocate thing here. Does, do, do most towns want the state to take over assessing? No, 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 the chatter that you see on the Vermont Association of Listers and Assessors is, it almost sounds like there's gonna be a, a mass resignation of listers across the state once this gets going. And, and at that point then, towns are going to have full-time assessors and, and no longer elected listers. Maybe that's where the RPC is planning on having starting to operate. I mean, it's going it's to happen. It's just you know, the listers have been around since the time when they counted the sheep and horses and cows. Mm -hmm. Those days are long gone. What's the deadline for the listers getting that certification? They gave us. They gave three years actually. So it's not like that onerous, but it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Dad. I'm sorry, Jamie, did you move that? I don't think I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I just started um, starting to lose track. I'll make a motion that we increase wages allocated for listers from 8000 to 12000 in FY24. Or could you do it by the hourly pay? To, to, in order to increase the hourly rate to $22 an hour. Effective July 1, 2023. Okay. Okay, so to increase the hourly pay rate to $22 an hour? Yep. Beginning July 1st. Yep. Is there a second? Second. Okay, further discussion? All right. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, discussion about personnel structure, Donna. Um, so I will talk about the treasurer hiring committee, then I'll go over some ideas about, John's going to put something up there. Okay. Um, so the treasurer hiring committee met last week, and it's really great having um, two committee members that have actually done a lot of hiring, advertising, and that's Mary and Miller, for the spring. Um, we're taking minutes. I think maybe Judy asked you to. Did she ask you to post minutes for this committee? No. Yeah, she sent them to me. Okay. So I, don't I have know to make you... a page for it. Oh, okay. Don't worry about it. Well, <laughs> but, I, it's um, on my list for this week. <laughs> so we are taking minutes, and I can you know email those to you if you want, or eventually they'll be on the website. Um, so Mary Ann Miller had some changes to the job description, which I'm going to um, input. And then maybe you all want to see it again. I think you've seen it once, right? The job yeah, we saw it. Yeah. Um, and then the committee talked about the need for references, background checks, credit check, social media check, and criminal background check. Um, it was noted that this should be done only in the final stage for strong candidates, and it should be done equitably, not just picking and choosing. Is that something that gets done for all town staff? You know, that we did talk about that, but, I mean, that's another issue is that there is, our personnel policy is completely out of date. Um, yeah. But maybe we can start that with, with this position, especially with the treasurer, I think you really need to have um, you know, some of this check out. Uh, yeah, we talked about the general updating of the fiscal and personnel policies was needed in order to correspond to the job description, job descriptions for employees, so that that process would not slow down hiring the treasurer. Uh, so then we worked on the ad. <coughs> um, and we're going to continue to work on that at the next meeting, which is on Thursday. And we talked about where we would advertise this position. And um, we're going to start with by putting it on Indeed. And then both 
Jerry Ann and Lewis said the best results they've ever gotten is word of mouth and reaching out personally to potential candidates. Um, and they also talk about using LinkedIn. They talk about not using seven days because of the expense. About not, not using what? Seven days because of the expense. And I assume it can also just be posted as a regular select board front porch forum. Right, and we also talked Post. about um, reaching out, you know, posting to professional organizations, uh, the Vermont Municipal Court Treasurer's Association, Vermont Municipal Court Towns. Uh, and so we're working on the advertisement. And with the goal of running it after July 4th. So we have not even settled on the salary, but it was the feeling that we need to move this forward. Um, and that we could start the advertising process before we figure out the salary. So I have a list of salary from the week's compensation today. <coughs> and Mary Ann this week is going to reach out to some other companies that aren't municipal related in relation to, you know, what are the salaries for traders in the general market? So that's something we're going to continue to work on, even when we advertise it. But if you want us to wait, like you're meeting on the 10th, and maybe on the 10th you want to look at the ad and the job description before we jump into actually advertising. Uh, what do people think? Do we need to, I mean, can we do that just via email and comment if we think there are changes that need to be made? or? I mean, if we can at least see it before, because I have no doubt it's a more comprehensive and accurate depiction of what we need in the treasurer than perhaps what was run previously. Wait, so, so I, I know in the past that some job expectations were kind of strange or unusual and impractical, and we didn't get a lot of people applying for them. So. I'm assuming you have worked through those things. I would still love to see you. out those things. <laughs> I figured as such. But it would yeah. still be nice yeah, just why for... Why don't I just, I'll just send you the job description after okay. the changes that we talked about at our last meeting. Um, because that, you know, just we want, obviously, when we send it out so that it's strong, so we get good candidates, and then, yeah, yeah that moves yeah. us forward. Yeah. Um, the other thing we talked about was that the remote work option should be advertised as a benefit and emphasized because people are so used to now being able to work at least part-time remotely. Mm -hmm. so. do, do you think they'll, they'll be able to determine the salary by, at Thursday's meeting? Probably not. I, mean, I will see what kind of research, because it's the area I did, if you look at the compensation survey from um, not the things in town, but we might want to do some more research. So, are you thinking that you would not publish a salary in an ad? It would be like maybe us, a, a, you'd, you'd say something like the salary commensurate with experience or something like that? that? That's what's in the ad now. Okay. So, because I would imagine we would have to approve a salary, but we just, it just sounds like we don't need to do that before an ad. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know that you'd lose much by not having an ad run the week of July 4th, just because, um, you know. We were thinking about like after, that was just kind of like an after July 4th. Just, yeah. just to have a goal so it didn't leave. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the July 10th mm -hmm. select board meeting. I'm not sure it has to come back to the select board. I don't, I don't feel strongly either way about it, but if it did, it j I just feel like July 10th wouldn't be like burdensome to wait until after July 10th, but I'm also not thinking you have to, so I'm not clear on it. And then we can also update the job description as we go along. We could advertise and then still. That's true. I think it'd be interesting to put the ad out on July 5th or something, and then when we're talking about it on the 10th, it would give us a little information if there's been radio silence or if you've had a few. And some, summer may not be a great time either. Yeah, well, right. except that every time you advertise, it costs money. So mm -hmm. it'd be better to be ready. And also, I'm just concerned about advertising without knowing the salary. Because as soon as people start replying, that's going to be the first thing they want to know. 
And if we don't have an answer, it's going to look like we don't know what we're well, doing. We will have an answer. Um, well, there's an amount in the budget. Oh, yeah, there's, there's tons of money there. that and you know, another position if we end up having another position. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, let's see. Do, so, so I think you're saying that you do want us to go ahead and uh, I'm going to send you the ad in the um, job description, either as a courtesy or whether you can make changes. Or, um, do you but you do want us to go ahead and start advertising. Do you think At we'll, we'll be ready to decide a salary on the 10th? Maybe. Because I wouldn't want to put, to Barbara's point, I wouldn't want to put an ad out if we might be three weeks away from deciding a salary because we might lose people. Well, why don't I talk to the committee members and just see if we're meeting Thursday and the 10th is quite a few days away and do some research if we need to. Yeah, I just, um, and I do, like, I actually, for, in a completely different context, I'm making a choice to not advertise something that I need to advertise for my job the week of July 4th, and I'm waiting until the following week to, to put that ad out, so that's kind of why I was thinking about, you know, that, the significance of that date and those people being, not paying attention to work things that week as much. Right, and if the, if the impetus is to actually, you know, talk to people, Reach out. Um, right. That's not advertising. Yeah. It's just and actually, if you're talking to people and reaching out to contact, it's you're more apt to leave a figure. Because you're talking to that person, it's not like you're So it kind of sounds like maybe it would be best to come back uh, to discuss it July 10th. Okay. Yeah, and I, I. Yeah, I'd say it would be. I'd, I'd prefer to see everything circulated if the committee comes mm -hmm. back with a with a number uh, in in the coming week um, to have that circulated to the select board. We'll mm -hmm. refrain from any chatter other than you know direct feedback if there are any revisions or changes or suggestions. But um, plan on posting an ad short of any changes uh, the Tuesday after the next meeting. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing would be sensitive, I guess, would, if there is momentum gained in the interim period to conversations, you know, that I guess this board's ability to engage in, or the committee's ability to engage in those conversations through, uh, through the holiday week, too. So it just seems like it'd be better to kind of hold off on advertising and until we're better prepared to take take any action on potential momentum um, sure yeah. okay and i like the um the suggestion of the the kind of background checking and due diligence <laughs> it seems kind of commonsensical. Especially if you, if you know anything about some of the embezzlement that's happened in town. Yes. <laughs> if you read VT Digger, you know that yeah. it's good to yeah. dot those I's and cross those T's. Okay, so on to the next topic. Um, I'm just going to read this for efficiency's sake. Uh, so uh, back in March, an informal working group was formed with a mission statement that was put together by Ann Winchester, Jamie Morby, Janet Ansel, and myself. And the purpose of the group was to look into how Callis might reconfigure personnel and finance systems for more efficient operation and to better respond to the increasingly complex demands on the select board, town employees, and volunteers. I'll give this to you. Thanks. I don't even know what to call it. Working group. <laughs> That's what we call it. Thanks. Um, so the group was tasked with making recommendations and providing options to bring to the select board. And so tonight is the initial presentation. Um, an important goal of this group was to make it possible for younger people to serve on the select board or on one of the town's other committees or commissions. And so one of the paragraphs in the mission statement I'm going to read to you, and it says, younger residents, including those new to town, are often struggling to meet the demands of raising families and busy careers, 
and had little time to offer, but they had a large stake in what happens in the community. These are just the people who should be actively involved in making decisions about the growth and management of their community in its future. Assistant, John, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, what I realized is that um, unless people are really actively involved in town, they don't really know uh, how it's organized. And so, what's up there now is our current town organization. And I've got, I've got hard copies here if anyone wants a hard copy. I Of course. I can mail this to you too. I like Thanks, Donna. I do as well. <laughs> and Rose, you've got that on email this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> and so I think what this shows is the town clerk is elected, and the town clerk chooses the assistant the town clerk. But it shows all of the people in positions that are put in selected. And you know, the treasurer, the road commissioner, the operations manager, um, all of the commissions and committees, and then all that list on the right of people who are appointed. You know, the animal control officer, the zoning administrator, um, and then down on the left there are the voting positions that this selector doesn't really have any control over. But I think it gives you an idea of the responsibility of the select board and all the people and all the uh, <coughs> positions that report to the select board. Who and are the trustees of public funds? I'm sorry, I'm just realizing. Well, they they manage the um, cemetery funds. Okay. The endowment account. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think by statute they're available to make recommendations about other monetary. So as we look at these options, um, one, a couple of things to keep in mind are how many hours does the select board expect uh, people to work? Is it 32 hours a week? Is it 40 hours a week? Um, and that is up to the select board. And what we have a we have 40 hours a week in the personnel policy, but the office staff doesn't necessarily work 40 hours a week. Um, the road group does. And then the other thing to keep in mind is the road from unionizing that some, some positions um, may be determined by union rules. And then the other thing to think about whether the position is elected, hired, or appointed. So, John, if you go to the next one. So, this is a town manager um, organization and it's defined in statute. And the select board would hire the town manager. And this is the Vermont League of City and Towns summation of the statute, which I'll read to you. And the town manager is a statutory position in which the state vests with the manager much of the day-to-day -day managerial authority of the town, which is normally reserved for the select board. For example, personnel, highway maintenance, supervision of public buildings, etc. And the town manager is actually the road commissioner. And this leaves the select board um, able to focus on policy decisions, adopting policies and ordinances, preparing <coughs> town meeting, holding hearings on zoning and town plan, updates, among other things. And towns that want to relinquish control of the day-to-day -day operations generally prefer to use the town manager form of government. And so, so you can see that in this scenario, the commissions and committees are important to select for. Town clerk is still you know, independent because she's uh, elected. But many of these positions report to the town manager. And in this example, the road foreman 
Um, and I talked to Toby about this. The road foreman, the idea was that um, the road foreman would do a lot of the paperwork, you know, the grants, with, with the support of the town manager, and would direct the road crew, um, and especially during the summer months when there was all these projects going on, that the road crew would be doing the paperwork for that, managing the road crew, but that in the winter, the road foreman could also help plow the roads. So this scenario, there's no longer an operations manager, there's no longer um, the seasonal road crew. Does the, do you have information on how many towns have a town manager and how big those towns are? I can get that for you. I have it. it it's, in the, it's in that survey that I, I went to East Point and I Xeroxed certain pages from the compensation survey. Um, I can get that. I think I can read it. And I propose an, an edit to page one. It's one of the things that we've formed uh, is an assistant to the select board, right? Um, yes. So that's that's a body of work that is currently being performed. Um, right, but uh, yeah, but, but I did this as without the temporary people. I mean, you were you were appointed select board administrator. Administrator. Um, right. So this is sort of historical. That's why I did not include the select board administrator. Oh, so but you, put it, you said it was you said it says current town organization. Current as in current before you had a brand new select board, and some changes had uh -huh. to be made to accommodate. Okay. Yeah, because I, I I have added that on here too. Yeah. Okay. I think it's probably helpful to add it to the current town organization because um, if the goal is to, um, you know, if our chair and Winchester is on the phone for mm -hmm. the folks in the room, if 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 she feels like an important next step is bringing it to the public and talking about the future of Cal's town government and you know make it have, helping the public understand what our staffing, what we think our staffing needs are and kind of having an, a conversation about it in that way. It's, you know, it's just good to represent that um, there's actually three part-time municipal assistant type jobs that, that need to be done. So I also have a list of each of these scenarios and the number of part-time and the number of mm -hmm. full-time because it's almost all the same. Because I think that's going to be one of the public's concern is are you adding more positions? Okay, so I'll add that So is the town manager generally uh, approving applications like right-of-ways and uh, curb cuts and other other kind of special applications that are going directly to the to the select board? I'm not sure. It's, it's really detailed in the statute, which I probably didn't bring with me. Um, but it's available on the broad leagues of cities and towns yeah. where you go. Because I understood it was a very concrete. It's really specific, this position. Yeah. And it says some of the things the town manager can't do. And we haven't gone much in Iceland really. Well, why don't we move on to the next slide, which is the town of Mill Next page three. And so a town administrator is hired by the select board. And um, this is from the Vermont League of City and Towns. The town administrator holds whatever administrative authority the select board would like to delegate to that position through a job description. Generally, a town administrator has less authority than a town manager. <coughs> and the Secretary of State's office says, hired by the select board, the town administrator, sometimes called the administrative assistant to the select board, Assist the select board in managing the business of the town. 
The town administrator has no independent statutory authority, like the manager does. And the scope of duties is determined by the select board. And then this option here on page, on page three, yeah. um, I put in a part-time assistant to the town administrator. Um, because if you start looking at a town administrator job description, it's, it's pretty enormous. Um, I saw between page two and page three was the word miscellaneous right here. A town manager, it looks like town administrator is the exact duplicate except right here you have the word miscellaneous appointments. And that was the only difference I saw between the two. Oh, that's this this question. <laughs> The, 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 the appointed, the appointed no positions in both cases, the appointed positions report to the town administrator or the town manager. Now, would the town administrator be comparable to what previously was called uh, DPW? Or is that a totally different thing? That's a totally different thing. Sounds like, it, so is this. So okay. kind of further cl clarify, it sounds like the town manager, uh, the statutory controls or definitions relative to the town man manager and their responsibilities are, are pretty specific, whereas a, a town administrator, while a statutorily recognized position or subordinate to the select board, there's more discretion left to the select board about defining what those responsibilities are. Right, because you would approve the, you would approve the, um, the job description. <clears throat> the position. So, so both of those titles are defined by state statute, but the roles, uh, the role of the manager is statutorily controlled and the role of the town administrator is designated by the by the select board. Right. I don't think this I don't think town administrator is defined in statute. Oh I see. I think you can call it select board assistant or whatever. I see. Um, but I think sometimes the you know what you call it is going to um, people are going to read into that title. Mm -hmm. You know Let's hire a manager or an assistant or an administrator. I mean, we're talking about it's somebody who can really perform a lot of tasks, it's professional, you know, has managerial experience and human resource experience, grant experience. So it's a pretty, you know, high level job that, that this person can have. Um, I would, and I don't know how much we. Just having been in it with the road foreman position, I would just strongly encourage to, if the group is considering lumping like all the grants that are road related and this person would be working outside with the crew and managing, it just, the grants alone is huge and we're going to get well, more the, the and more. The um, town administrator or the would be doing some of that. Grants. Okay. Yeah, and obviously, they have to talk to the, the foreman or, or whoever. Okay, because um, I thought previously you said something yeah, that would be tackling okay. a lot of that, and I just. It could be a substantial amount of time just paperwork and grant writing. And right. So, I'm sorry, well, so what is it that you're saying? No, so I wanted clarity around, I don't know if I had heard it correctly, that a road foreman would be like combining a Toby. With an Alfie, which would have been a one and a half time position, because so it was like part time and Alfie this whole time, and that the road foreman would manage much of the road grants, which are a huge amount of work, um, and also provide oversight, and then in the winter be able to go out and work with them, and as opposed to someone who just 
goes out in the field and is working and monitoring and... I thought with a union you can't have that person go out and work with them. The foreman or the manager. So those pieces as far as like the a foreman can be or not be, we haven't gotten that far yet. But it can go either way with union stuff. You can have one that is and one that is not. Okay. Well, I think this is very, very preliminary. Yeah. But okay. the town manager or the town administrator, one of their major things would be grants. And obviously, the foreman or somebody on the highway crew more closely with the town okay. or the administrator because they have the knowledge of the roads. Okay, so this one uh, is to town to administrator with part-time assistant. So this would be, so the assistant to the clerk and treasurer is uh, theoretically a full, like that's two part-times equal one full-time, and then there's, an, then there's a part-time uh, town administrator assistant. Well, I, I started thinking back about when did we have an assistant treasurer? And I think the only, I think we had an assistant treasurer when the auditor said, you've got to have some separation of duties. And so, I can't even remember. I think, I think it's, it was after Eva, we started with you, because you had, no, no, Judy wasn't your, wasn't an assistant treasurer, was she? She, she was only assistant yeah. town clerk. So that's kind of something I think we need to discuss. Is, is, so, because now we have Nemrick as doing part of it. So I think Sandra was the first assistant treasurer right. to Judy, uh, to, to, to you, Donna. <laughs> so it started out while Donna was assistant to yeah. town clerk, and while Donna was town clerk and treasurer, Sandra was hired as assistant treasurer. And I think that was the first one. And then, then when you stepped out of treasurer position, you hired Sandra, and I became the assistant treasurer. So right. I think we've only had two. So right. and during that time, then we had um, either we had accountants doing some of the separation of duties. So it was Spotty goes to Gallon Valley when I was there, and now it's now we've got Sullivan Powers as real auditors. And well, so anyway, well, well, all this is up for great. discussion. And, and while we're discussing it all, uh, one thing that comes to mind is that in the current system, the assistant clerk is appointed by the clerk right and the assistant treasurer is appointed by the or suggested by the treasurer by right. the treasurer so if we're listing it as one position that's just a funky <coughs> nuance so that, that, that we'll have to one. work out yeah it was another one of the corrections uh, yeah <laughs> it's, it's just been we've been lucky that we can have one person right <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a daunting Future without our yeah. we'll, we'll have to that's, that's, that's address that. On, on my copy of the current one, I scratched out uh, assistant treasurer under the town clerk because I don't report to the town clerk right. for assistant treasurer, and yeah. I drew it under the treasurer. I drew the box yeah. for assistant treasurer. What you, you don't report to the town clerk as assistant town clerk <laughs> as assistant treasurer. Right, but you. But, but, she, but the way it is here, it says okay. assistant clerk and assistant treasurer reports to the town clerk. Yeah. Okay. Right. But Got it. I only report to the town clerk. I've never used this software before. You. It's a it's a minor, it's a minor yeah. detail. And it's also trying to theorize a little bit the current construct, which just happens to be you do everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you go to page um, four. No, I got this idea. We, we, don't, have we don't have a page. I do. I do. I do. In my printout, I'll share. <laughs> what, what is page four? Page four is a town administrator. It, it says page two. Town administrator with one municipal assistant. So, so, so are you counting this as page one? Because, because the page is another. Page four. Yeah. Okay. Well, on my on my version, I got from you to the town administrator is page three. We have we have two town administrator pages. Uh, oh. Our, so, so our that, digital I, copy doesn't. I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, the only difference on page four is. 
What they were talking about was rather than having like, you know, two or three or four assistants, was to have a was to make sure that the jobs were um, meaningful, challenging, fulfilling, um, you know, worth a decent wage. So on page four, and I've got a hard copy here for everyone, so this has and I got this idea from Smart Code. Yeah, do you have an extra copy? Yeah, right. Okay, great, thank you. Is a municipal assistant that assists um, the town clerk, the treasurer, and the town administrator. Because at this point, we don't really know if we, with all the thousands of things that the select board is responsible for, we have a town administrator helping. Is that person going to need some support? You're asking if the town administrator will need an assistant? That's why there's two town administrator pages here. One with the municipal assistant that, well, on page three, it's a, I think I put down, yeah, I had a part time assistant for the town administrator. Mm -hmm. Now on page four, I've got a municipal assistant for the entire office. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and is there any, option. yeah, is there any statutory um, blockade that says that the town clerk who is elected gets to choose their assistant where it would be a yeah, problem so with having clerk gets to choose their assistant. Right, so if you omit the assistant and there's just a municipal assistant, I'm just, I'm just thinking it through out loud, like is it? That is an issue because see in, in East Montpelier, they appoint their town clerk. Mm -hmm. And that's how they can get away with it. So I, I think, you know, the, the, the amount of assistance needed is something that, you know, we'll have to talk about. Yeah. Because, I mean, right now Barbara's assisting the select board, but she's also got two other jobs. Um, yeah, and there's also the issue of long term having three distinct, possibly three distinct part time jobs. You know, it, it sometimes part time jobs are very appealing for people, but speaking to the thing of having longevity, sustainability, yeah. you know, someone who is um, just more engaged and committed, it lends itself more to full time, I think. Yeah. The, the other consideration is space at the town office. If whoever is required to be at the town office, does they need access to the files or the vault? You only have so much space in the town yeah. office. We're still trying to figure out where to put a treasurer. Right, right. Now that is an issue. Yeah. So, um, well, thank you so much. This is, um, this is, I think, a great food for thought and help thinking about this. So one thing, so I, I met with Donna on one occasion. She showed me these org charts. And I, I, I'm trying to figure out one of the options, I think, that we talked about was the town administrator being the road foreman. Is that what the town manager chart showed? Well, the, the town manager is the road, is the road commissioner. And that's just the law. Okay. Um, that's a flaw, you said? It is, no, no, it's, 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 it's the statute. Yeah. Possibly a flaw. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the law. Yeah. Um, what I had talked to, because I sat down with Toby and we went through, you know, what's. He says he's never been to a. Um, he's never been to a town garage where there was a road foreman that really could do everything that Toby does, and work on the roads, and, um, you know, manage the road crew. It's pretty tall now. Yeah. Um, Very different skill sets. Yeah. Mike Aaron did it for 30 years. You saw it for Yeah. Is he still around? <laughs> you know, I was in my kitchen yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> He's retired. He's <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the grant 
environment has evolved quite a bit. Yeah. So the grant yeah. environment uh, has, has evolved quite a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the general money. municipal grant, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah, and we, I mean, this is this all has to be discussed. It's, you know, and they can maybe the road for them because of the union can't um, you can't be supervising or directing the road crew members and doing paperwork. I, I don't know how that all works out. But so the the other thing that we talked about, um, well, I think it was Gabrielle and Ann and myself was having a meeting and encouraging the public to come to talk to the public about this. To, get, to share it with them, to get ideas, um, to be transparent about where the select board might be going, and also the need. Mm -hmm. I think that would be good. Have, have you started putting together a list of uh, tasks, or not necessarily roles and responsibilities, but kind of work workloads for each each of the positions currently? I'm just kind of curious about like how certain things get shifted. I think an initial concern about four is with the municipal assistant is that we're, I think there's meaningful improvement and sustainability gained with consolidating a number of those part-time roles into a centralized individual who's, who's tasked with each of those things, but I'm concerned about the select board administrators functions uh, versus the assistant town clerks for uh, functions versus the assistant treasurers functions and whether or not it's actually feasible to kind of cover the needs of all of those mm -hmm. three entities and yeah I, know, I do have a list of um, for the manager and the administrator I think you know, I'm talking to Sandra because I've sat down with her a couple times. It's tax season, it's really a killer. And that's when, you know, an assistant, I mean, you can speak to that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have my notes here, but what Sandra said was that to be a treasurer, um, I think she said you could be a treasurer 32 hours a week if you had four hours a week with an assistant, and then Nemert. I mean, Nemert would still be doing the reconciliations, they would still be doing payroll. Um, and part of, part of having Nemert is also a separation of, of duties and tasks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So potentially back to the the interplay between road activities and town administrator. Um, if the town administrator had a municipal assistant, or if there was a municipal assistant and a town administrator who was the select board administrator, potentially, depending on the individual and their either experience or trainability, could do grants, road grants. When, you know, after being trained by Toby, and and take that on moving forward. Um, and I was thinking that grants is one of the main reasons that the town administrator might need an assistant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, to move this along, I think that um, and and Winchester, you can way in but I, I think you have a tentative plan to put this on the agenda for july 10th is that correct yes i was thinking of a town-wide discussion maybe in the first hour about this yeah and and it potentially inviting uh former select board members chairs and um and as you said other other folks uh, that are interested in this subject of what I'll call the sustainability of town government. 
and uh, you know, creating an environment, a welcoming environment where people's you know, best capacities and capabilities can be used on a volunteer basis because they're not putting out fires and dealing with emergencies and, and that there's c capacity built by having professional staff to um, for the select board to be able to do more basically a volunteer job and bring in other people to do other volunteer jobs. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, that to, was And to make it feasible for, I, mean, I don't know if the four of you want to do this, but I mean, isn't it kind of overwhelming? <laughs> to make it feasible to have the support, <laughs> to have the support yeah. that, you know, people, you're all pretty good, but um, the support for the young people can serve on the select board. And, and on, yeah. you know, some of the commissions and committees, they need support too. <clears throat> yeah. but, if, if, but if we go before, if we you know, encourage a, a public meeting, are there changes you'd like to see in some of this? I, I don't think, uh, some clarity, I think, uh, around what what would need to be done to take action? I mean, I, if so for one, you know, we currently have an assistant clerk position that is that is defined in the hierarchy. So, what's the process for making a change that would shift that around? Um, you mean the assistant? Town the assistant town clerk. I don't think anything we do about that. Yeah, that's in state statute. Every town has to have an assistant town clerk. Has it's to. And it's appointed by the town clerk. So, but could the town clerk appoint the municipal assistant to be assistant town clerk? Does that work? I mean, that's not that's not worded that way in state statute. Yeah. The town clerk can appoint whoever she wishes. I mean, I would think a town administrator would want, would want to appoint their own person. Although you're talking about the municipal assistant. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the select board would appoint the person. <laughs> because it doesn't seem like, even if we, as a town, choose to go this direction, it doesn't necessarily re remove the potential for. Uh, an assistant town clerk, if the town clerk so chooses to to appoint one. So, well, they don't just get to appoint them; they have to like have a budget that's approved, right? I mean, you can't they can't appoint an assistant and not pay them, or they can't pay them without the select board saying this is what you can pay them. Do we know? <laughs> well, I mean, it's it is always been the it's always been the Money in the budget to pay the system. Well, yeah. actually, we never had a system. She was a one woman show. It was a different time. It was a different time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay but is it. So you're saying clarity around these assistants? Is that kind of. I think that would be good. And, and I think for the purpose of a public hearing, is. A, a handout, a fact sheet that people can have that night with this definition of the difference between a town manager and a town administrator. Because when I look at the spreadsheet or at the graphs between a, a town manager and the first town administrator, there's no difference in the flowchart at all, except the word miscellaneous. But you gave a great explanation about what the difference statutorily is between a town manager. Their job description right. is written in state statute, yeah. as opposed to a down administrator would be as at the discretion, at the pleasure of the select board. So and maybe a fact sheet of those explanations yeah. for this public hearing. And the other thing is, I think, Ann, you were talking about like a list of everything that the select board is responsible for or does. Mm -hmm. And it would be, because I'm not sure people know yeah. <clears throat> everything that you are required to do. There's there's a list. I mean, we oh, no. we got the list when we ran for the positions, right. but at the 
cities and leagues has has that has that list. It's a bullet point list. I don't know how comprehensive it is, but and whether or not it's the greatest hits um, of responsibilities for the select board, but that that's definitely on there and a, and a place to start. The town of Thetford did um, a handout, and it was what is it called? It was called um, Oh, why the town? In their case, it's a manager. Why the town needs a manager? And a lot of it was around the open meeting law. You can only make decisions right. twice a month, and you're sitting here. Um, and I could steal from that because so, it's a really good explanation of why five volunteers can no longer do this job. And I think, and I think, some more back to the clarity point. Some more clarity around the decision making um, aspect of it because as a town administrator you may be appointed or delegated by the select board with certain authorities to take certain actions relative to uh, just board orders for uh, for sake of uh, example but um, if if curb cut applications or right of way applications, uh, anything that would necessarily be subject to appeal, I would think that there would need to be a policy for what that appeal process is. So if somebody wanted to appeal a decision that a town administrator took, uh, that would have to get kicked back to the select board, for example. Um, and I don't know if any of these other towns that have town administrators like have those types of policies, or if the cities and leagues has yeah. has it, uh, some counsel on on how to structure or manage that. Personally, I you know I I try to balance anybody's will, any government body's will to delegate tasks with the responsibility of that of that group of individuals who are elected by their peers to make those decisions yeah. and not just delegate them to somebody else who isn't necessarily accountable to the people who elected them. I don't think we're ready. Um, Personally, I don't think we're ready for a town manager. I don't think, I, as a voter, I don't want to give up that much power to one person or another and you all share. No, and I, th and I think what I'm kind of working at from a personal perspective is I, I also wouldn't want to necessarily delegate too much, even if it were a town administrator. Yeah. You know, the, the, there are some of the more kind of clerical and uh, administrative responsibilities that I, you know, I think could make sense to delegate, but mm -hmm. I think there's a careful balance and conversation to be had about even, you know, Curb cuts and right of ways may seem t uh, tedious, but this body is the is the connection to the ordinances mm -hmm. and policies that um, that are established by the other commissions well, in the group. Just, the yeah. manager, what if we just present a, a town administrator position? What that would mean? Well, I, I think so. No, you, yeah. you like having the option. I um. So speaking to, I just want to first address what you said, which is in my mind why we need whatever it's going to be a town administrator or a select board administrator um, i agree town manager is kind of a little bit of a, a foul ball but um but i'll get back to that in a minute in my mind it's not that they're making the decisions it's that they're doing what ann winchester and barbara butler are doing they're getting the agendas i mean we had a four hour four and a half four and a quarter hour meeting two weeks ago and you know i don't i I'm suspecting it would have been shorter if there had been somebody behind the scenes who was um, compressing the information, gathering the information. Like, I mean, we got it done, but um, I think that the, a town administrator slash select board administrator is um, doing a lot of the work that is currently being done, first of all, by, by Anne and, and Barbara, who's working three part-time jobs. We don't even know how many hours a week. <laughs> and um, and so I think it just, it, it's not so much that we're delegating the things that we currently vote on, for example, but that, um, you know, they're there to give us all the pertinent facts, the context, 
and um, and quite honestly, we don't have to think about it as much um, in order to form an agenda. And you know, we can essentially, in a lot of for a lot of meetings, read a board packet and come in knowing yeah, what we need to know. To yeah, yeah. So so that's one thing. And the thing about not you know talking about town manager as an option is I, I'm in favor of still talking about it as an option because um, it's not like we're promulgating it as what we want to do. It's just that people can know that there are these different options and, um, and in some ways maybe it's better for people's expectations if they know that we're not like looking to relinquish our you know local provenance and our control and things like that, but just like make it so that it's a doable job. For yeah, everybody. The league is working on a paper that compares town manager to town administrator. And they said they didn't have it formatted yet. Now, I don't like you about the format. <laughs> uh, and uh, I talked to a lawyer there. He said, maybe we can give you an advanced copy. So let me, let me get that. I, I think it sheds an important filtering light on, on the conversation, <laughs> you know, even if it's not something that's being right. expressly recommended i mean it's it's an important informative part of the right. conversation this is one of the options yeah. and it's one that we've sort of stepped away from for these reasons but this is what we learned about it through the process right yeah. it shows the public that you right. looked at it as exactly. an option right. there are reasons you're not going to go in that direction there are reasons you are yeah, yeah. I just wanted to get back to what you were previously talking about a few minutes ago um, about different things that the administrator could do or whatever. Um, here in Callis, Eva Morris for many years issued curb cut permits until it was found out that she couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that she wasn't, there are she wasn't allowed? There are jobs that the select board has to do, and one of them is manage the roads and curb cuts, right-of-way permits, all that stuff. <laughs> it's all up to the select board. Um, just thought I'd throw that out there. But there's some things you, you might want to give up, but you can Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sorry. The, I would love to know, I, I would love for the public to know what those yeah. things are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because... Oh, the things you have to do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, so I made a note here, so I'll follow up with a week on that. Yeah. You know what I what I actually think would be a great resource for that meeting too is have a stack of the agendas just from when we started. Oh. So be, because and the way these agendas get put together is incredibly informative. That's why I can yes, yes. chair this meeting without having done nearly the prep that that Anne and Barbara have done. But um, but the way she does these is like I mean there's a lot of telling what what it is that we're dealing with. But just by that, looking that at is these. one of the best things that this board has done. It's been really yeah. transparent about what you're going to talk about, so somebody can choose to come or not. Right. Have you all seen the select board handbook that is from the LTC? That lays out. It's like the Bible. Yeah. Right. Now, are they still updating that? I thought I, thought I heard they were updating that. Uh, I think the version that I have is fairly up to date. Okay, so do we um, need more clarity for next steps, or? Why don't I... Um... Donna, are you around next week? Yes. Um, why don't I work with you on that? I can help you with the formatting of some of this stuff on the, on the flowchart side, if you want. You, you mentioned that it was a new... It's called Lucid. Yeah, there's. I have an, I have another one too. Uh, okay. That's. Uh, but anyway, we we can fuss around with it. I think it'd be helpful to add some notes on what's appointed, what's elected, who's. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Be happy to help you with that if you want. So I guess now what we're really talking about is what are we going to present to the public on? Did we say July. 10th? July tenth. Yeah. So. Maybe I can just make a list of kind of what we've talked about here and get together with Jordan about the chart, about making the, chart. the organization chart. You know? Yeah, the town manager versus town administrator, um, the duties of the select board, mm -hmm. and 
I honestly think just a stack of our agendas would be, I don't know who have, would have the time to read them. I'll do that one for you. How's that? I'll take that off. Now, is that, is that a visual? Is it, or is that just kind of, what's the, the, what's the purpose of that? I, mean, I, I love your agendas, but is the purpose of that stack? And... I think the purpose for me is like, if you ask me to say all the stuff we've done since um, oh, right, March, right. I'm like, I, I need to look at the agendas because I can't even remember that there were, you know, well, I do well, remember the dog hearing, for example, but other things. I that, a huge list and just hang it on the wall. Yeah. Just as a visual. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't want to be, I don't want be, be side, no, I don't want to be sidetracked by being held accountable for things that... <laughs> We've done that. Maybe we've gone under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Um, but yeah, I agree. Okay, um, okay. Anne, or any um, anything you want to add from your sick bed? I'm sorry. Would you repeat that? Is there anything you want to add to what you've heard of the plan for July 10th? Uh, one thing I would add is dealing with when somebody dog bites somebody or when the beavers um, go after the road or uh, it feels like every week I spent many hours mm -hmm. just dealing with something that came up that was unforeseen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, again, that's why I feel like this is instructive. So. Okay. All right, thank you so much, mm -hmm. Donna. Um, all right, so select board reports. Um, the secret garden meeting at Maple Corner Community Center actually didn't have a whole lot to report on this, but now um, we have Josh and Kristen Schultz have, have come to join us. Welcome. And, uh, and so what I was going to say was that uh, Jamie and I both attended an informal meeting that Carlo um, do I need to sign this? Uh, who is the owner of the Secret Garden uh, put on at the Maple Corner Community Center on June, what was that, like the 9th or something? 10th, something. Um, and it was attended by a few dozen, a couple dozen people, including the Schultzes and other neighbors from their, um, their area that have been um, that, that hear the music when they are playing music up there. And uh, this was, um, at the time, uh, after the meeting, Jamie and I spoke informally with the Schultzes, and we did not um, know of any particular actions or ordinances that were pertinent to the situation. So that's just kind of how we left things. And, um, they had written a letter to um, to our zoning administrator, and um, and also unbeknownst to me at that meeting, there was an inquiry with the Natural Resource Board, and um, the uh, for a jurisdictional opinion about the Secret Garden, and that said that they need to seek an Act 250 permit. And so I don't know any other information other than that um, there were plans for two more events. Um, actually, the event that kind of kicked it all off was, um, I think, a friends and family kind of event. So the actual events that have been marketed and um, that they're selling tickets for are July 8th, um, so coming right up. and. Uh, and September, and it's not clear to me whether the requirement to seek a permit put the kibosh on that. I actually don't know. So, um, so as far as a select board report goes, that's that's about all I have to say. But I think these guys. I don't know if you wanted to put something specific forward, or if you have more information you want to share. Sure. Thank you. So, everybody, I'm Josh Schultz. Good to see you all. Um, and this is my wife, Kristen Schultz. Um, so yeah, so at the meeting, you know, there were some things that were said that, um, you know, that did more information that came out of that meeting that really concerned us and other other folks that live up the road. Um, 
And one of the things was that was talked about was potentially um, leasing it out four to six times in addition to having the two or three of these events. So now suddenly it got it got escalated to more more events. Um, and they're you know this is thoroughly commercial. They're charging it seventy five to one hundred bucks for a ticket. Um, up to four hundred people go in there. It's it's loud. That's a lot of traffic um, in the middle of the night, going from four p.m. So you know after late afternoon to uh, two a.m. Um, and it was said at the meeting that there would be there would be drug use. Carlo said it. He said there will be people doing drugs here. And um, and he did say that they, if someone was acting unusual, they would ask them to leave. But you know you the neighbors said about on the road to drive. It, it, well, that's, that's <laughs> that was one. Take of your that, molly and go. <laughs> as, as we were leaving, that was one of the big things that we were talking about on the drive home. You know, was like, gee whiz, you know, this is not just going to affect. Our corner of town. This is the roads in Calais, you know, with impaired driving. Um, so, you know, we have some real safety concerns. Um, Carlo did invite us up there. Um, he said, if you all want to, anybody here, this meeting wants to go up there and kind of walk around the area. Um, he said, feel free. So, um, I took him up on it. I went up there, just kind of walked around and, and looked around. I did. I did notice actually there was a couple things I did see. I don't know if the select board's aware, and maybe they're already aware. You guys are aware of this, but. There's definitely a driveway going up there. I don't know if a curb cut permit was ever required, um, but there's clearly a driveway there. Um, there's also been work done on on the Woodbury Mountain Road that looks like it was done. I'm going to guess by Carlo. The only reason I'm saying that I, I I don't know for sure. So what I'm saying here, you cannot take this to the bank. But um, he did mention um, someone asked him towards the end of the meeting. I don't know if, if uh, Jamie or Gabrielle, if you guys heard, but someone did ask, hey, what about like police and emergency vehicles can they even get up there and that road gets washed out a lot um, and Carlo mentioned well I have a I've got an excavator so I can fix it so we were up there it looked clearly like there had been some work done on the road in the ditching right around that, that that curb cut that's in there and I'm not that's not my realm I'm just letting you guys know what I saw when he invited us up there so I took him up my weapon looked and I and that's what I saw um, but um, you know the, the neighbors um, we all still feel that as we read the zoning regulations, um, it, 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 it says that this, this district is not suitable, it's, it has in there unsuitable for commercial use. This is pretty clearly commercial. Um, and I know that there's nothing um, in the permitted or conditional use columns that mentions like music venue or anything. And in our opinion is because it's flat not allowed. Then something like this is commercial. So there's no need to put it under permitted or conditional use. In, in our opinion, anyway, the neighbors, um, we all feel like that. that's why. Um, just to kind of put a little bit into context for you, and I know, um, I know, I know John's right here, but I just put it in context for you. I did, um, one of the conditional uses requiring DRB approval would be um, if you want to put in hiking trails. Not commercial hiking trails, just hiking, as I read it anyway. And, I, that was sort of a gee whiz moment, like, you know, we get a DRB conditional use approval to, to hike or ski or horseback ride or bicycle. But if someone wants to put in a music venue until 2 o'clock in the morning and invite 400 people and, and do all these things, then that wouldn't require anything. And, our, and again, it's sort of our opinion that that's because it's just flat not allowed for either, either permit or conditional use, um, based on, as we read, the, really the tone of that, of that purpose when you read the, rec the resource recreation, in our opinion, is that um, the tone of it is that it's supposed to be, this area is, is, is encouraging low density use, um, non-disturbing use, um, kind of near keeping this, this area, this natural resource area in, a, in its near natural state. Um, that's kind of, that, that's very much the tone as you read this. So. Um, those are just some of the neighbors' concerns. So yeah, we did learn a lot in that, in, uh, learn some, but I will say that everything, Carlo did say, well, hey, you know, I might be willing to kind of like not renting it out or, you know, changing my hours. I mean, he did mention that, so I, I, I'll let everybody know. Um, but I have to say that it didn't necessarily leave there feeling too warm and fuzzy because that's just simply somebody's word that could be changed at any point in time. There's really no, nothing that's bounding it um, right now, so. But like, where do those 350 to 400 people park? Is there adequate parking? Do they have parking lots? Is there, I mean, I just understood that area of Calais to be like a wildlife corridor and 
Isn't that why we couldn't have houses down the road? Because it would disturb the, but it's okay Well, there's, yeah. there's, there are plenty of houses on Woodbury Mountain Road. Yeah, yeah. It's a, and a lot of four-wheelers. Right, two year-round houses and then camps further out. A um, lot of Jeep and four-wheeler traffic, but there's a log landing just, I went up to the site a couple weeks ago just before that meeting, and there's a log landing from a neighboring parcel that did a bunch of logging uh, over the last two or three years. Um, and my understanding from just going up and down there on my bike with some regularity is that most of the road work that looks recent um, was done over the last couple years by the logging company. And the question about you know a landowner doing work to a class four road without select board permission is certainly a, a question. It's a hot topic. Um, it's, it's a hot topic right now. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> but, um, and, and I don't know how much um, he has done recently, but I know a lot of the improvements you see have been there previously from the logging company work and maybe other landowners up there. The logging well, company put quite a lot of rock in that road yeah. so they get the logging trucks up. Yeah. That's what you're seeing. Mostly. Yeah. Well, I, but I think there, there needs to be kind of a, a a careful distinction about what work was performed, what resources are available, and then how they're being used. It, you know, to, to have to have a space on a parcel designated as a log landing that's approved by a civil cultural plan is one thing, but then to say that somebody can then use that as a parking area multiple times a year for an event, you know, that that takes that changes the context of the use of that of that space mm -hmm. that it's that's been cleared and and so um, I, I think we need to be careful about kind of equivocating about you know work that's being done with the intention of facilitating civil cultural use or other uh, approved usages in those in those zoning regions and 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 saying that those cannot then also be used or applied for for other functions um because that that changes the the use of the land yeah. well, and it its impacts the, uh, the another thing that was uh, i think left as a a a question mark was the um, the use of uh, county road for parking because um, it was that was definitely part of the plan was to have the overflow parking be on county road and yeah. it could be like many dozens of cars and so um, that was I think the thing that was maybe the most tangible to the select board potentially although this is the first time we've talked about it and i don't i don't know what is um how what ordinances or whatever come into play um other than we just discussed that the select board is in charge of the roads um but uh yeah so i don't know if there's a permit that would be allowable for an event that allows people to have well, we do have that, right? Because when people have weddings and whatnot, don't they and get permission the to park? Aren't there to raise thirty-five thousand dollars in profits, which is. I don't. I don't believe there's any permit for that. Okay, so it's just like the neighborly thing to do to just be happy for the people getting married and not bother them about the cars parked on the road. I can only speak to how it worked for my wedding <laughs> uh, in Maple Corner and the very generous neighbors who <laughs> did not gripe about it. But, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a right to peaceful enjoyment, uh, reasonable peaceful enjoyment that everybody is welcome to. And I think at some point there is a gray area where that threshold is, is is there there's no ordinance um, or or permit for for having an event um, or for parking vehicles on on 
town right of ways. But if it's um, an ongoing commercial enterprise, even if it's only done four times a year or eight times a year, I mean, I'm just thinking about our already stretched thin volunteer fire and emergency department who don't seem to know have a bed brought in on it. Like, are they going to be called out and then having to try to squeeze up a narrow? I mean, West County Road is not exactly conducive to parking cars on either side. Carlos said at the meeting that he spoke with, I think, the sheriff, state police. state police, and that they had said it should be fine as long as they put up signage or cones to ensure that cars only parked on one side of the road um, and not on both sides. Of the road. I'm but that's just what he said. In the okay, I'll give him a call tomorrow. Yeah. You know, because too, they're stretched really thin, so you know, if someone. I don't isn't the word commercial? I mean, a wedding is one thing, but a commercial enterprise just has got a whole different level. To be clear, it's not a commercial enterprise. It's not in permitted or conditional use. It's in the preamble to the section. It's commercial development. It's the only time the word is used in resource recreation. So what? So you've seen the jurisdictional opinion from the Natural Resource Board? Have you seen that? Have you seen the jurisdictional opinion that got sent out to, um, it got, so the, I, when was that, June 10th or something? I'm not sure, I don't know the date. Okay, so the Natural Resource Board was asked to weigh in on whether it is, I didn't see okay, all right, so um, can you can you forward that to, yeah. to did you, did you? I didn't find it, but basically they found that because it's over 10 acres, it is a commercial enterprise, they require an Act 250 permit. Oh, I did hear the Act 250 was involved. Yeah. So I would assume that because they required that permit, it would have prevented it, but it seems like it's still actively selling tickets and I don't know. Maybe next time, Jordan, you can have it over on Bay Pomoli. I'm sure your neighbor did not know. 350 folks lined up. On the roadway. I mean, I, just, I, I don't understand. I don't understand it. It just seems really dangerous. And so this, this event is going to involve more than 10 acres of land? No, but it's 10. The parcel that it's on is 10.4 acres. Yeah. So anything over 10 acres falls under the jurisdiction of Act 250. As part of their ruling, and that it's for commercial purposes because... I knew that 10 acres of use, mm -hmm. for the specific use, but I didn't know that it's, just because you have a parcel that's bigger than 10 acres doesn't mean yeah, it is not. I, I don't believe it's 10 acres of use. I believe it's use on a 10 acre or larger I parcel. Don't think anyone who has more than 10 acres and wants to get a building permit, why would they go to Act 250? They did not go to Act 250, I don't think. This isn't a commercial thing. I mean, it's not a commercial entity. Isn't it considered commercial if you're making money? Like he's making. You could, you could have a piece of toast with Jesus' face on it and charge 100 bucks to, to come pay for it and look at it. You don't need an Act 250 permit for that. Well, Act 250 does say that if it's over 10 acres, right? If they're using more than 10 acres, I don't, I don't think that's before. how it's written. And I don't think Act 250 would see eye to eye with that. See, Callis is not a 10 acre town. We used to be. We're so not that, anymore. The, the Act 250, I just forwarded you the Act 250 jurisdictional opinion. Uh, by the Natural Resources Board, and in that they're saying the basis for decision is that Callis is a 10 acre town. There, there, there is a big mistake here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not defending Carlos or anything, but Callis is not a 10 acre town. We've gone through this so many times, mm -hmm. and if we have zoning regs and a town plan, we, we don't, we're not a 10 acre town, but for some reason, about a dozen years ago, they had us down as a 10-acre town. It was an error. That error was finally caught. For anyone to believe we're a 10-acre town now, that's, that is a mistake. This, this one, right over here, you're getting, you're getting bad information from someone. We're not a 10-acre town. That's directly from the Natural Resources Board. And th I know. And yeah. they were saying we were a 10-acre town before, too. Huh. They're, they're wrong, so someone should check this out. Job would it be to check that out? In Winchester. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can just like just say one thing, like we are I, I do think that if if uh, there's a music venue that's charging people a hundred dollars for a ticket, that sounds very commercial 
commercially to me. Um, yeah, but that's not commercial development. So commercial use, I guess I'll say. So um, we don't have a prohibition against commercial use. In the re in the I, I guess I would disagree. I mean, just the way I read it, when it says unsuitable for commercial, industrial, or high density residential development, or is necessary. I mean, when it says commercial, I, I guess that could be. It depends on how you interpret that. I guess yeah, I interpret I know, it as commercial. Uh, I, I I I use the word of development as it's in the zoning regs. It's defined so, in the so, yeah. the definition. So, by, just speaking for this corner of the community, I guess I'll just say this, because I, I, don't, I don't know if this is the forum to debate, but I, maybe it is, I don't know. But, um, but I just wanted to say that, like, these folks in town, there's, there's a lot of us that are going up that road. We all are concerned. This is really changing the area. People live in a town like Callis to have the peace and quiet and tranquility. Um, you know, we live here for a reason. We don't live here for raves and parties deep in the forest where anybody with a computer are invited to them, up to 400, um, to come in and potentially do drugs, get impaired, and then get in their cars and drive. Um, that's just not why people live in this town. And I just feel like, um, I think it's an important town issue. I do, I think it goes beyond just our neighborhood. I think a lot of these issues would could spread across the whole town. And, um, you know, we're just trying to, we're trying to do what we can to protect this corner of the community. Um, we're trying to uh, just maintain that, that the, the environment that makes callous callous. And um, this, is a, this is a big change that's being proposed right now. And um, there's a lot of concerned folks, and I guess I can leave it at that with you all. Um, I know there's limited stuff that the select board can do. Um, so we're, you know, just trying to um, you know raise this red flag as best we can. Yeah, no, and it's fair. I mean, I worry about the drug use. I know the trafficking, drug trafficking on the east side of town is spreading, unfortunately, in more pockets of people wheeling and dealing and all of the crime and overdosing and whatnot that comes with it. Um, it's definitely impacting our community. It's dangerous for our older vulnerable folks it's you know, yeah. okay. yep. Wait, do people understand what a 10 acre town is, is that, because i don't think i remember i, I wrote down what's a 10 acre town <laughs> i mean is it okay for john to give a quick definition that would be that great means? yes please what, what, what does it mean a 10 acre town versus a non-10 acre town if, if, the, if, the, if a town is called a 10 acre town usually it doesn't have zoning rights so any use of land, any use of involves more than 10 acres, it needs back 250 review. And we were that. And suddenly when, when it was realized, I know that me and Jan Olson and maybe Paul Hannon, this, I'm going back to maybe 20 years, we saw this, well, what's going on? And a number of us made trips up to, uh, to the natural resources folks and Su Susan Baird at Act 250. They finally said, oh, Please, you do have zoning. You're, you're not a 10 acre town. Thank you. We've got, and I, I bet I can find the letters and documentation that follows that. But somewhere, someone found a file that said we were still a 10 acre town. So a 10 acre town does not have a town plan or zoning? It doesn't have regs. Maybe it's got some little, little plan, but it doesn't have regs. Like so, Twister? Like Worcester, it's yeah, kind of a free for all in Worcester, Indian I town. think maybe not, maybe Worcester's not even a ten acre town anymore, but they used to be as well. A lot of towns were smaller ones farther north you go. Well they always write you can do whatever you want when they're selling homes and stuff, so I think there's no But I, I'm appalled that this whole ten acre town thing came up again. And because we, we put a lot of energy in trying to figure out what was the problem here and they finally said, Oh, my bad, you're not a ten acre town. Yeah. But it seems like there's still some paperwork floating around or people haven't gotten the message yet. Well, and I don't know about the 10 acre or the not 10 acre, but just seeing how much struggle some people have to do anything, but it seems like this large number of people that probably are not going to be super ecologically minded. Um, and <laughs> both on someone's property, but then on lots of other places in our town that we're so keen on preserving and not damaging and keeping the woodland creatures happy. I just, I don't, it's, I, 
it confuses me. I can't understand how it can be a thing that is considered. And if it were located in a different section of town, would it be different? Would then there'd be more push? I just I don't understand how. It's I think actually. what would be different is if people weren't hearing the music and that set things off on a really bad foot. I mean, especially there weren't cars. There weren't a lot of cars no, that time. No, because there was only twenty five. Now we know the noise. Now we know the impaired driving. We just had a 16-year-old get hit by a drunk driver last year on our on Main Mole Road. If and people in town are worried about lowering the speed limit, they should really be worried about drunk drivers on the road. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is huge. Like if you know drugs are happening in our town and you're just sitting back and letting this happen, don't complain about the speed limit too. So more people should be stepping up and hearing about this. Because it doesn't only affect Calus, it affects all the way to Montpelier. People coming from Burlington, that's where most of the people are coming, on the interstate. It, it, this, this is huge. Yes, like no, I think they did dance. say no alcohol is allowed. Oh, no, it's no, BYOB. No, there's it's, there's it's alcohol. Allowed. And if there's drugs, there's alcohol. <laughs> there's absolutely yeah, it's it's BYOB. BYOB. And it's snacks. I don't, be your own everything. So then, too, you have some underage drinking and driving. Even better. Yeah, I guess I was remembering like that they don't have a liquor license. Right. It's being marketed as a party deep in the forest. Like, kind of, I mean, you read between the lines, but come here and do what you want to do. No, Josh, you know, last year when they had it, Josh walked up just to see, like, what was going on. And he walked up with a person from Cabot and didn't know who he was. And Josh was like, you know, I don't want to just come and see what's going on. And the guy says, yeah, dude, like, there's nowhere safe to party anymore. Like, we're going to get caught. So deep in the woods, why not? Mm. You know? Right. Yeah. Not helpful. <laughs> I mean, well, he was not yeah. helpful, too. Well, it's part yeah. of now. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, that, so this got put on as a select board report. I really appreciate you guys coming in. I don't quite know what this select board's next steps are, but um, I, I really do appreciate that you came in. I, yeah, so, I just want to thank you guys for taking testimony. I know you didn't have to. I appreciate that, so thank you very much. So before we move on, and thank you, um, I'd like a little bit more clarity on uh, some outstanding things. I, I think it would be, I would, I would like to know who would like to take responsibility for reaching out to uh, ANR about clarifying their justification for designating Callus as a 10 acre town? It's the Natural Resource Board, but the natural resource I think board. that should be John. I'm really looking into it. I don't consider me an official appointee of the select board to do it, but I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of that. So, John, I just. Um, quick looked up the NRB's website and on their website they have a, a list of all Calisana. 10 acre and 1 acre towns yeah. in the state and Callis is listed as a 10 acre town as is Barry City, Barry Town, Berlin, East Montpelier, Montpelier, Middlesex, Northville, most of Washington County. <coughs> Worcester is one of the few that's a 1 acre um, but most of Washington County is listed as a 10 acre town. Okay, so. I don't know what, where that fits. My understanding is that 10 acres of land have to be involved in, in whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's clearing to make a parking lot or, or all this. Um, if it's that any development on land bigger than 10 acres needs to have 250, how many properties do we have in town that are more than 10 acres? That are getting a garage or something. Why? Why aren't those properties getting Act 250 permits? It's because you're not involved in 10 acres of land, even if it's on a 25-acre parcel. I, I think this that natural resource folks should clarify what they're what it is they're talking well, about. Well, it's not. I mean, a, a, a re, a, because if it's a residence, you would not need a Act 250 for a garage on a parcel greater than 10 what acres. Is, what is, uh, it is a stage and a parking area, I think. And he was using it and paying them. Is it Carlos's or is it Andrew Shepard? 
Uh, I don't know. Right. So part of the jurisdictional opinion stated that um, Carlos bought the property from Andy Shepard, um, but has not actually paid for it yet. And he has a, according to the opinion, he has a five-year payment plan. Um, and so act the NRB is saying because of the arrangements of that land transfer, they're considering Andy a co-owner in the parcel. Okay. If he still owns this, the deed, then... nothing to do with the land use right. regulations. I... Well, I, th I think... I think you're the appropriate person to, if you're willing to be the liaison with the Natural Resource Board. And mm -hmm. they, if they issued an incorrect jurisdictional opinion, they should issue a new one. And we should figure out if it's not Act 250, subject to Act 250. Because if he has to go through an Act 250 permit, he's not going to do a thing on July 8th, right? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Just, what? I don't know. So, but we, some people do things and don't care. Maybe they don't. He doesn't seem like a don't care person, I, but I don't I know. I think that it well. would be good for somebody to reach out to Carlos. I hesitate saying, but. Andy Shepard told me that his impression from talking to Carlos was that he this Act 250 thing was a lot and he was going to throw in the towel and not hold this party. It is but a deal. That is purely speculation okay. from Andy. So, so because it's still actively selling out. tickets. Because my right. sister-in-law was like, "Oh, I totally saw that on Facebook." Yeah, the I'm website. Like, oh my gosh, Jimmy. The website is still listing tickets for sale. Yeah. Um, so you're saying somebody should reach out to Carlo. Yeah, this is, um, let's put this aside. John, you are going to reach out to the Natural Resource Board? Oh, sure. Susan Bear. She's not there, She's not there anymore. It's, a uh, Sabina Haas. Well, why don't you maybe... I think, she's, I think yeah, she's, she's... Oh, that's she Susan. Signed Susan the, Bear. Okay. The I'm sorry. I was thinking of a different Susan Bear. Yeah, I saw her name on yeah. That's the right person. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank I think we're ready to move on to roads update. Um, I just sent you all like a two page. You can read it actually in nature about stuff we're doing. Uh, the only thing with roads that I was hoping to touch upon at this late hour um, tires. Historically, apparently, I guess, Alfie would pick up tires around. It was just kind of a here and there thing. But long story short, we moved five tons of tires from the town garage yard. It was over a thousand dollars and over a hundred tires per uh, legislation in 2012. Over a hundred tires is bad, and we're not a licensed salvage yard. It just the neighbors were complaining. The guys felt it was unsafe. It was just like a huge breeding ground for mosquitoes. Um, so they're very adamant that they no longer want to be a salvage yard. We're getting rid of old ancient culverts. We're cleaning it up. So with things like tires, if they were to pick up tires from one person, they would have to pick up tires from all the people. They would also need to take those things to the dump the same day, and the town would be paying for it. In March, the Central Mark, um, Waste management has grants open. I believe we can get up to a thousand, possibly more, specifically for things like tires. And if we perhaps time it and educate people, so even before green up, say, hey, we've got this grant for tire collection, we're going to do it on green update. Tell me, God, do not throw it over the side of the road like two weeks out so someone else can get Lyme disease climbing over the bank to pick up your tires. Like, just like an amnesty thing where people can bring them and then maybe. In the meantime, people that are seeing them on the side of the road, if they have a friend who has a barn or they have a place where they're not amassing a gazillion of them, if there's a place where people can stick them until this spring, or, I mean, Bill Davis went and moved to Couch off Peekingbrook. He had to ride his tractor down there and that someone just dumped. I mean, there's a lot of things dumped on our roads, but we just don't have the manpower, frankly, the money for them to be spending a lot of time each day 
doing it. And if we do it for one, we do it for all. And if people know we do it, then it's going to... So you're saying that people would call the town garage and ask if the so road crew could pick up their, the, their tires? Yes, the, that's the, a thing. This specifically, like on the side of the road. But. We would take them there. How many were on Robinson Cemetery? Over oh, 15. One night, a truck came by. Next morning, the, the road was littered with tires. Someone was just driving along, throwing little tires out. Yeah. So John took them to the town garage. He, he, he called over there, right? They said, called over, and I was told that, yeah, these are, this was junk thrown in the town right away. I gathered it up and took it to the town garage. It wasn't like my own tires. Right. So this came up because I've had at least six individual people complain to me about a pile of tires that was dumped recently on Robinson Hill Road. Um, and so I had offered to pick them up and bring them to the town garage, um, but they don't want to store them there anymore. And so I've sort of been brainstorming it, crossed my mind to pick them up and throw them in my woods until green up day. <laughs> my parents weren't very fond of that idea. <laughs> um, so if anybody has woods, they would want to destroy them. In. Um, no, but so I just said I'd bring this up to try to have a conversation about how we as a town can respond to these public dumping situations, which are really ugly and it's unfair to the property owner who it's um, dumped on. Yeah. And when it's yeah. right on the side of the road, it's a plow hazard in the winter. Yeah. I feel like we need to have a, a way to respond to these situations. Yeah. I, I don't know what yeah, that is. But it's also actively discouraging, because just like with Green Update, literally every year you can always tell when we're just a little bit out, because all of a sudden people's tires are going from their garage and getting just chucked over the bank or chucked over the, you know, or up at the old dump, people love throwing them over the hill there. So I know their road crew was like, we got you brought down the dozens of tires. And I was like, see, went over the bank and like dragged all of them up so you wouldn't have to do it. Yeah. So it's not like someone went and like box trucked a bunch of tires over and stacked them neatly. He actually pulled them up off the bank, but it looked like someone had gone in. Yeah. But. So the Central Vermont uh, solid waste. What, what are the, or what are the what are the fees associated with disposal? Oh geez, it was it's seven. Well, it was two hundred and sixty dollars a ton that they got Casella's. That was the best they could do. It was and the big sixty. And the big ton. threshold was the hundred tires or more. And a hundred tires are approximately a ton. Yeah. And for an individual, it's seven dollars per tire, or I think fourteen for a tire with a rim. So the municipality has better, better pricing on disposal relative yeah. to keeping it under a ton. So did they get disposed of or there's yeah. still a ton of garage? No, the, all the, there's no tires at the garage. That got disposed of because we were kind of back and forth on it. And I think just several green ups had gone by and you know, last year was wonky for a lot of reasons, but no, the town paid for it. Okay. Yeah, they figured they, they they it out. Many a dump truck trip went to get sell it. Because I think you authorized that. Yeah. Prior yeah. Meeting we did. Yeah. yeah. And, and they did. The money out of the budget. And they yeah. did. And that's why they were, because the neighbors too were also like, eh, because, and if the thing got forbid I caught on fire, it would have been a huge environmental disaster. So it was just bad. On a lot of fronts, and it's really hard to like. We could have a little pile because you know the little pile becomes a big pile. So they're like super adamant. But when and they when they're saying they can't do it for one, because then they'd have to do it for all. They're also doing it for you know the people that are picking it up from the side of the road, that are just getting it off the side of the road, right? So it's not it's not. No, that no, it's, I know. But if they pick up, let's say pick up the six from Robinson Cemetery, then they gotta head over to Peck Hill and get a couple over there. Haggard Road. I mean, I've been driving around the roads with these guys, and there's stuff everywhere. And right, but I mean, are they objecting to it being a place where tires yes. can... they do not want any tires stored there. They do not want to be a self yard. They do not want to amass. They are very, very, very adamant. And the property owners, too, because just you can't keep water out of them, then you get mosquitoes, it's, it's a whole thing. So they don't want to have any kind of fire storage on site. What do you mean the property owners? So people that live near the town garage. Oh, okay. I've been, I, I had been, as the Green Up Day coordinator, I had thought 
for years that tire disposal happened each year after Green Up Day, as with trash disposal, and was covered with our grant. Um, it turns out that that used to happen in the last few years that hasn't happened, and they've stayed at the town garage, and I'm not sure why. Um, but I've been I've been playing phone tag with the Green Up Day, the state executive director of Green Up Day. Um, to try and learn more about the process on Green Up Day so that, and what we're allowed to do in terms of collection and the grants paying for tire disposal and such so that we can do it properly next year and get rid of them in a timely manner. Okay. Has any research been done as to how other towns handle this problem? I mean, that, that's one of the questions I was going to ask the Green Up Day coordinator. Um, but in terms of regular tire pickup, I don't know. Because maybe we could email, you know, East Montpelier, Plainfield, Marshville, right. Middlesex, and ask them how they handle this problem. Yeah. Well, and I wonder if it. Like, if it was a known thing that our guys would go and pick it up, which I think is a fairly unusual thing for towns to do, if that some people were like, eh, it's okay, they're going to come and get it, and it's going to be fine, and that maybe if people are aware that's not going to happen, it would reduce it. I mean, you're going to have the jerk who left the bathtub on Valentine Road, like a bathtub and a grill, and then his name's in the grill. So, mm -hmm. That was smart, but... But you could have got money taken into a scrapyard. It, see, it seems unusual for the road crew to actually go pick them up and get and collect them. But that may be not unusual to give people the opportunity to drop them at the town garage. Right. Do it, yeah. And, and then it. dispose of them in a timely fashion so that there's not more than a ton of tires there at any given time. And maybe just maybe you dispose of them once a month? Yeah, they're going to fight it. And I don't blame them because it was pretty egregious, but... The neighbors or the road crew? But the neighbors and the road crew, they just, they think it's a, unsafe to have piles of cars there. <clears throat> I just had a quick comment. You know, as you're sitting here talking about this and the, and the tires and whatnot, and I'm just trying to recall, and Donna, you might help me too, that in the 18 years that I was with the select board, I don't ever recall them openly talking about picking up tires as a service or anything. And I'm wondering if perhaps Alfred just kind of did it as a courtesy yeah. and, you know, he did it. But I can tell you that I don't believe it's anything that officially came from the town that will store your tires, will take them off your hands. And it's beyond me how that pile got to be so big except for not properly disposing even if they collect them once a year and get rid of them I, but there was i don't believe there was any direction official direction from I, the board i think that's totally true i think that it was you know a big truckload every green up day yeah. and when when people like you all described called them and said you know, hey, can somebody dumped tires on my property. Can I put them to the tire pile? He just said, sure. Yeah. Um, but I agree. I don't think there's ever been a, a town policy. No, no. And the, I don't think there was any direction from the select board no. that, you know, because we knew that the cost, you know, you have to go and dispose of them yourself. And, isn't there something called a town dump that's on? Yes, it's no longer a dump. So once a week, uh, which road was Brian that? Brian Perry's is Moscow Woods. I mean, people do go and dump stuff there over the banks, and then we get it on trade update, day. But we rather people don't do yeah. it. Um, it used to be a road dump. That's where you dump your stuff when I was a kid. Yeah. That's where we cycle. But Brian Perry's comes, or Brian Perry and Sons comes on Saturdays in the morning. For the dump, but I don't think they take tires because it's like a, yeah, it's a specialized thing. You know, and I think like Bill taking responsibility for moving that couch off of Peking Brook, he just took it to the dump himself and paid for it. 
Isn't there Which a less expensive way of disposing yeah. of tires every every December during Bill's for warmth? Yeah. I, mean, I don't, know that, that's, I don't know that that's designed to take hundreds of tires at a time from a town. Like it seems, I I don't know the answer to that, but um, and that that does that costs money, right? They somehow well, make on money the from website, it. On their website, it says, "What did I send you, Jamie? Ten dollars a truckload?" Yeah, something like that. They didn't define truck. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, but if it's seven dollars a tire, I don't care what truckload it is. Right. If it's a small truck. For ten dollars, it's. And I think they yeah. take any kind of tire, and then they it's decide not, which ones are to be reused. I don't think right. it has to be used tire. I, mean, I looked at the website. I sent yeah. a link to you, and it doesn't have to be use reusable tires. Yeah. They can be right. unsalvageable tire right. tires. Right. And they mm -hmm. dispose of them. So what? That's once in a year in December. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, we, the, the actual big event is once a year, but uh, when I looked at their website, it didn't say you could bring them only once a year. It didn't say you could bring them any day of the year. It just wasn't clear. <laughs> yeah, I think it is a. T I think it is a finite period of time. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's not an ongoing. Long, long, long. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Um, I think the takeaway from this is that we don't really know what to do about it, um, <laughs> except that we should, um, Jamie, I think uh, getting with the statewide Green Up Day person will be really helpful and just making sure when tires come in on Green Up Day, they're, they get to go to their next life after they get collected. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if you were looking for an action or anything, but... Oh, no, I just wanted to, because I know people are asking, and there's been a lot of discussion and just being... getting rid of the pile. I think they're just profoundly... They don't want another pile. Not wanting it back. Yeah. In any yeah. form, and that's not unreasonable. You know, it's not really a space to be collecting that stuff. Yeah, I don't know how the town could, I don't know that the town would want to pay someone to, if they do clean, I don't know. Um, okay, I think that's enough of that one for now. So do you want to talk about the no parking signs? Sure, I think this can be quick. Um, so for many years, there have been a shortage of parking in Maple Corner and challenges with parking um, for community center events and other large, you know, events like the Blue Barn and the swim area and Maple Corner events. Um, and historically, the community center has asked tenants to put out cones on the, across from the community center from the store parking lot to Worcester Road um, when there's events. Now, with the Whammy Bar open three nights a week and increased events at the community center, it's, it's onerous to put cones out every night. Um, and so the board of the community center, in conjunction with the board of the store and several local uh, neighbors, proposed to me that the town install no parking this side of the street signs from the, on the west side of County Road. I put a, a map in the Google Drive folder and I can pass this around. Um, so it would be on the west side of County Road from the store parking lot to the Worcester Road. Um, and it would look like basically a no parking this side of the street sign, you know, maybe two or three of them. We'd leave that up to the road crew. Um, and then as this discussion is unfurled, um, it was pointed out that it's dangerous to have cars parked on the north side of Worcester Road. We'll get you the map. <laughs> north side of Worcester Road for the first 100 feet where Worcester Road leaves um, County Road. 
because there's the intersection right there, and when cars are parked there, it's hard to have good line of sight um, at the intersection. So the proposal is for no parking signs for to cover 100 feet of Worcester Road and the, the distance from the store parking lot to the <coughs> Worcester Road on West County Road. Um, and between Don Heiss and Heidi and I, we've, we've chatted with the majority of neighbors in that section um, who have all been in favor of that plan. Um, and I was, I, I don't have a, I haven't met with the road crew to sort of spec it out, but, but my proposal would be that, that the select board approve um, my working with the road crew to determine exactly how many signs and where are needed to achieve the goal of, of eliminating dangerous both side of the road parking practices in downtown Maple Corner. Do you think there's enough parking for people minus that parking? I mean, I don't think there will ever be enough parking for people in Maple Corner. No, I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge. It's a, a challenge with the Whammy Bar. It's a challenge with the community center. It's a challenge with events at the um, Blue Barn. And, and really, it's a challenge with the swim area as well. Um, and I, lots of groups, there was a group eight years ago, Indivisible Callus, uh, that looked at this issue and spent a year trying to find a location for a park and ride or a something without success. So I, I don't think this solves the parking problems, but I think it, it makes it safer. Um, I can't speak for the section of Worcester Road she's talking about related to Curtis Pond swimming area, but the part of County Road across from the community center, it's not going to change the effect because right now, when there's an event, th there are cones out there restricting parking. What we will change is the safety of it because I've been one of those people out there at 1030 at night collecting the cones on a dark, there's no lights out there at all and you're yeah. in pitch dark trying to get these cones off the road and not get hit. <laughs> so it would be a safety factor for the people to not have to go out there and do these pick up cones. Put cones out there. Why are you doing out. the cones? Because As we a... were hosting an event at the Maple Corner Community Center. Okay. And the, and the people using the community center is not responsible for putting the cones out. The people using the, this community center for an event have to do it. Okay. And years ago, there was a similar problem. The big problem is when cars park on opposite sides of the same road at the mm -hmm. same time because it narrows the road. Um, mm -hmm. There was a significant problem with that years ago around the swim area. And the, the town put up no parking this side of the road signs across from the swim area on both sides of the hill. Um, and it's largely been successful. I almost never see cars parked um, on the wrong side of the road there. So I think this is a, a solution that, you know, increases safety and decreases labor for people hosting events in town um, and, and will be effective. Uh, I'd make a motion for to authorize Jamie to uh, investigate the placement and number of signs that would uh, need to be installed to be effective relative to the input of the road crew and coming back to the select board with a specific number of road signs for procurement. So we're not approving the purchase? Uh-huh. Until we know, until we know <laughs> how many there are. <laughs> and the cost? Uh, yeah, and the, and the cost. So yeah, I just... That's fair. Okay. Uh, is there a second? I'll okay. Um, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 aye.
Okay. All right. Uh, Road. Yeah. Before you move on, may I? This just came in today's mail, which is why it's not on the agenda. This is a great big map of Palace Roads from the Department of Agency of Transportation. And so I want to pass it on to our road commissioners. But before I do, I wanted to ask, would you want me to take it to Capital Copy and get more copies made? Yeah, I would love it for the garage. So, so how many copies? Because I figured we have two road commissioners. We have the road crew. We have Toby. Yeah. We have the select board. I mean, I mean, are they costly? Oh, it's nice. I mean, you have this on the Palace website, but it's like, what's I know. Right? You know, it could be five dollars a copy. I don't know what it is, but before this gets torn up or dirty or anything, yeah. would you like me to get copies made, additional copies made for other people? I think it would be included. I don't know. But is it a road? Made, so say it's a road. Two more copies for the road. For so. The, if you see the maps on the Cali's website, it's on the Cali's website, but it's a big, a clear. Copy. So we're not like making a photocopy with bad <laughs> resolution. And yeah. it, it, it's, like, I'm pretty sure that's Mark's road. This is not what you would call a road map. It doesn't say like Kit Hill Road, County Road, Beacon Brook Road, Jack Hill Road. It favorite. shows by this key the main roads and and what kind of a road they are. So it's not yeah. like what you would want for an, a, 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 I, I would want to stand there and study this road as a community member and go, oh, that's where I live. But it's it's good for the road crew. Yeah, I mean, we use that when plotting out, going and doing segments and things. So, but See, I mean, it, it is available as a full resolution PDF on on the Department of Transportation website, but I'm not opposed to. No, you can have it. You can take that same PDF to Capital Copy and have them printed at at whatever resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, like five copies. What do you guys think? Well, do, do John is uh, is this similar to one of the ones that you're ha having mounted foam mounted for here? Because I'm just wondering I, if I would hope if, that one he's getting he's doing. I was going to put it like label the names of the roads. This doesn't even label the names of roads. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't that, doesn't that show the class? Yeah. It does show the class names and the trails and the. Yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah. 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 Washed out. Okay, where are we at? Um, so it sounds like you want a few copies. Thank you, okay. Barbara. Yeah. Uh, and the road sign inventory. This is the subject that keeps on giving. Yeah, so I know the guys have ordered signs for the, all the roads that are missing them that get stolen the second they put them up. So I don't know why we keep trying. But so we got the like last time we put this up it was gone in like one day so would very much a popular one to get stolen but those have been ordered um regarding that inventory yeah. there's no jamming i did is that something we might be able to like tap into our local walking community or <laughs> maybe people that are out and about every day doing their thing because it's got the specs on there correct and they could be like yes this is the same sign or this is no longer the same sign uh, we could potentially seek volunteers, but I think they should be trained. So that would take somebody's yeah. time to train. But I, I mean, I think if we could do some upfront training, I just think getting the just especially with all the rain, the workload is is a lot. And yeah, how much? How many? How many hours of roadside inventory do you think that there are? Would it take to like plot every? walk around all 92 miles it's going to take a long time I, it hasn't been partially done i thought it was well along on its way to being inventoried yeah. Our, the roads we're working on the roads not signs so we have to update all the road statuses are they up to state standards or are they partially done or that's what i've been working on great toby sent us a road sign inventory from a few years ago um, and, and I thought he said he thought it was fairly up to date, but would need 
you know, at some point somebody should go around and just look at them and say, yep, this one's still there, or this one's... It's in your Google folder. It was yeah. in the RPC dated 2013, which was 10 years ago. So that's a few years back. <laughs> okay, I just remember you said you were going to be working on an inventory. Was that the road inventory? So that is for the watershed, yeah. That is the... I'm going to mess up the acronym, but the one with the little segments that involve go to waterways where you have to update if they are like Max Gray on our map through this state is up to snuff, but the reality is it's definitely not up to snuff. We're actually going to be working on it. So we have to go and update those to what they actually are right now. So it's not all 92 miles. It's only certain segments. Some roads have a lot of them. Some roads don't really have any. Um, but that's what I've been working on, not sides. So for this roadside inventory, it strikes me a couple of different things. One could be like, figure out approximately how many hours and what training is required and get a couple of teenagers to do it. Hire them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Another thing is, sorry, do you want to? Oh, I was just going to say, I think it would be pretty easy to get. Team volunteers too yeah and I just pulled it up it looks like there's about 300 signs in town on this list and we could sort it by you know we could create groups I mean it'd almost be nice to make like a fun event out of it but if you so what I would suggest for a next step for this if you want to seek volunteers is kind of sketch out how to seek volunteers what information you need up front get the information and just plot it out a little bit but I you know I think it yeah maybe you could do it schedule it for a day yeah. and end it with an ice cream social or something. yeah yep I like that yeah you might also be able to break it out into areas of town East yeah. Callis, North Callis, Anime, yeah. Maple Corner yeah because I yeah. figured there's some people that you only have to do one section in each community, how those roads all the time would be able to tell and, you. And it, 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 the actual work wouldn't have to be done on that day, right, yeah. but it could be done any day, given like a 10 day window or something, as long as it's completed by the day of the I think. Yeah, so this is, a, this is one of those things where volunteers, you know, you, there's work up front to do to get yeah. volunteers to work, but yeah, um, I think. So is it, can we, can we leave it to the road commissioners to kind of sketch it out a bit and then, yeah, okay. All right, uh, so let's see, Curtis Pond Dam, I don't have anything to say on that. I have a quick question. I heard that the railing was approved, Linda's railing. Um, so was railing. that, did it go through BCIL? I just... I thought it was coming through us and it was mentioned one week and we never talked about it and I just, because it, I want to ensure that it was accessible at least for the majority of people to be able to use it. Yeah, at town meeting there were a bunch of suggestions and then the Curtis Pond Association was asked to sort of oversee and implement it. Um, we talked to several contractors, John McCullough did a lot of the design work. Um, what we settled on is a, a rail. It's got sort of a higher adult size rail and a lower kid size rail. Um, and it's going to look great. John got some decorative frogs, I think, that are going to be on the railing post tops. Oh, but did it go um, through it, VCIL I, like we had talked about at the town meeting? I don't think that VCIL ended up being involved. Um, at the town meeting, that was discussed and then it was swapped to the Curtis Pond Association. Okay, but it would be, um, and they were going to yes, It's going to be ADA standards. They, they got advice from a lot of people who... Uh, okay, well just yeah. because Peter's part of our community too, and Barry Bernstein and they had all brought it up, and my understanding was that while the Curtis Pond Association was in charge of that money, that they were going to bring the design to BCIL because certainly my concern would be that even if people think it's lovely, cute, adorable, if someone comes in and it's not ADA, from the specifications, then it could become an issue. The, the swim reliable. area will never be ADA accessible. It's it's steep, rocky, root ridden. Um, I, th I think this is this is not designed to be an ADA, ADA 
compliant recreation area, which would, as discussed at town meeting, but would I be think very the railing, expensive. I think the vote was that the railing would be ADA compliant. Yes, the railing itself. Okay, but the, right, yes. okay. But the, the location is not an accessible location. Well, no, because yeah, historically we'd have to have a ramp and it would have to start yeah, 500 yeah, yards, yada, yada, yada. But yes. I just recall that VCL was going to be yeah. at least providing it and like us there who put in. So in the spirit of equity and inclusion, <laughs> so one of those things that because what's accessible for some people might not be accessible for others. So. Well, I mean, sure. but 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 clearly, like it's a rail that is meant to make it safer to go down a steep, rocky slope mm -hmm. to a swim area. That I agree, I can't see how it would ever be ADA accessible. So, I mean, other than the fact that maybe VCIL wasn't exactly consulted, like do, if the rail itself is ADA accessible, do you think that they fulfilled the spirit of the? the thing or do you want them to do something else? When, I just, when we had agreed at town meeting that that was that they were going to be at least asked about it. I, I don't think so. I don't think that the, if you go back and read the town meeting minutes. I have the minutes right there. Yeah, I don't, I, that, it changed. That, that was the discussion well, no, for I know that they had the CIL, but it got flipped to CPA. Mm -hmm. Yes, but then there was discussion that they would at least Say, hey, does this look good? And I know it's not going to be ADA in the two ADA sense because obviously it's not an accessible, but accessible to the most people possible. So, what, what was your question about this? What, was, did the is, voters, what was the end result? What right. The end result was, was, was the vote, the motion, and the proof that VCIL would be consulted in the design. I don't think it specified that in the notes. That was just my recollection. So um, the whole the whole thing, like Bernie Barry Bernstein called the question um, to add seven thousand to the BCIL to install the railings, and that vote failed. Mm -hmm. um, and then back to the original amendment, the motion Linda Schultz made to amend this article to include. $4,000 to install handrails at the Curtis Pond swim area. Further discussion ensued. Peter John Geese of the town is legally obligated to make the swim area handicap acceptable. Um, Donna Myers recommends that the Curtis Pond Dam Association form a committee to work on getting the handrails installed and give them the $4,000. Tom Ricardo said the town needs to have the work documented if you can't meet all the codes of the ADA law. Fletcher Dean said it's a slippery slope. Um, John Brady noted we can amend the original town budget as an option. We can't undo the original previously passed article. All right, Daniel, Daniel Keeney called the question to end debate. Gus Seeley recited the motion to give $4,000 to the Curtis Pond Dam Association for the one-time purpose of adding handrails to the Curtis Pond swim area. A division was called and the Board of Civil Authority led the hand count. Gus Seeley reported 80 yes votes and 30 no votes. The main article was amended. So VCAL was not in the final vote. No, no, it wasn't part of the final vote. Just yeah. there was a, that they were going to at least consult. But it's not documented. They'll yeah. remember, but it's not documented, and that is fine. Jess. Well, there's a lot more before that. <laughs> no, I, I went through it. It was a lot. It went on for a while. Okay. Um, so, anything about the status of the bond vote? Oh, um, I spoke with Thomas Maloney, who said that while 
not everything in the process was exactly perfect. He was confident that uh, the bond vote was done uh, acceptably and that he could easily and confidently defend it to the bond bank. Um, so that is no longer a question. Um, Isn't it, don't we have to certify it or something like that? <sighs> yes. <laughs> Did you get that paperwork? I, I, I've not seen any paperwork on that. Okay. That was a little while ago. Um, so, but or maybe did we not certify it we two weeks ago? Already? Uh, let's see. Are there some certified something? Okay. Well, what, let's uh, uh, minutes in the folder while you're looking at that shared documents and emails. Any updates? Okay. Checking that one. Status of shed v callus. No. Okay. Collective bargaining team. Plug it along. Plug it along. All right. And what um, did you say? plugging along. Oh, okay. I really can't <laughs> talk about it. It's in process. Yes, yeah, I can just say that it's coming along in the process. Right. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Okay. And are you trying to look in the minutes yeah. from two weeks ago, just in case we want to certify it right now? Is, there, is it time sensitive? Can it likely wait till July 10th? Um, what did he say about that? Um, there's a state statute that allows a select board to validate the vote of the annual meeting. I recommend the select board take such action to address any questions as to whether front porch forum counts as one of the public locations for public notice. A draft resolution for such purchase purpose is attached. The resolution includes a notice of official intent that allows under federal tax law, the town to reimburse itself from bond proceeds in the event that the town spends money on the project in anticipation of the issuance of the bond. Uh, note the resolution does not commit the town to spend funds. It provides an opportunity to reimburse the town from bonds proceeds if any such general funds have been spent on the project. Um, and the resolution was in our folder from the last meeting. Um, I forgot to put it in the folder for this meeting. I think at the last meeting we reviewed it and decided we wanted to review it further and vote on it at this meeting. And then we lost track. Of it. The, the minutes of the last meeting are in the Google folder. Yeah, it says. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, uh, I just read it. Uh, I don't think. I, I think maybe the reason that we did that, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, is was that it was not warned as part of the agenda for taking action on the previous meeting. Minute. Previous right. meetings agenda. Okay, so technically it's not, it. we didn't say we we're going to do it, but I think it's, it says status of bond vote and we need to validate it. So I mean, it, it could either wait till July 10th or I don't know if this is. Should we get it wait till July 10th or is it time sensitive? It's both. <laughs> Um, I'm going to say let's validate it, vote to validate it, and if it turns out that we need to warn it, then we'll warn it and vote on it again. That's a good, that's July a good 10th. Yeah. Okay. I think that's fine. It does say in the agenda um, possible action on these. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So is there, do you need to read, is there a resolution that should be the motion or can we just? Or do you have, do you have to sign something? Um, let me pull it open again. It does have a spot for, uh, it says signed by all or two thirds members of the select board. 
wish we had a printer here. Do you want to Jamie, email you... that to me right now and I'll run over to the town office and print it and we'll come right back? Sure. Are we going to be here another 10 minutes? It's almost We're, we're done other than that. Um, that was our last thing. So, uh, I mean, I'll I'll run down inside. If three signatures is enough, Wait, we can, can probably get three can signatures. Can we authorize us to sign it and just have it available for signing in the town office? Over That's the okay with me. Is that okay with? If I'm going to see any of you tomorrow night at the BCA meeting, you can sign it there. Right. That's true. Yeah. Jamie, okay. Are you still abstaining from those types of things? Am I what? Abstaining from those types of things. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't be one of the signatures. Signatures. D d does it have to be dated and you all signed it on the same date? I don't think that's ever a thing that is a is a legal requirement. It says adopted at a regular meeting of the select board on such date. So that would be tonight. But you I don't think it. it needs to be signed on that okay. date okay. necessarily. And then it needs to be signed by Tegan. Okay, she'll she'll attest to that yeah. after the fact. Now she won't be back for another ten days, so if it has to be attested by Tegan before then. Doesn't it just have to stay in the town office, or where does that have to go? It has to go back to the attorneys. Uh, she's just saying Tegan, Tegan has to sign it. I know, but that's what I'm saying. If, if this document lives at the town office, Tegan can sign it any, or does it have to go to... I think, is it part of the bond application process? Yes. I do hereby certify that I am the clerk of Callis. This is all true. It was truly adopted at a regular select board meeting on such date. So it's just her certifying that we adopted it at a select board. So that's fine. I just want you to know she's not a, she's not right. in the state to sign it and attest to it until July the fifth. This is for a future discussion, but I want to know if we can start electronic signing things. That would be a real time saver. Um. I use it all the time <laughs> for other things. So, okay, so if this can wait, we can do it, Joy. Why don't you go ahead and adopt yeah. it tonight, so it can be in the minutes. Yeah. And then I'll have it available at the town office for signatures. Yeah, I okay. think that's, and then we can send it off to Thomas with our signatures and say, you know, Tegan will. Well, and, and if, he, if he has to have it back before, July 5th, then I, I suspect in the absence of the town clerk, the assistant town clerk could sign it. Sign it. I'm going to forward this email to all, all right. So what's now. the motion we need? Let's, let's do that. Um, here, it's two pages long. <laughs> I, the last, the last meeting and tonight, I heard you use the term "validate the vote." Validate the bond vote. Okay, so we're, March, I'm looking for a motion to validate the bond vote of uh, town meeting 2023 to for the Curtis Pond Dam bond. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Of four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Here. Four hundred fifty. Yes. So the the actual language of it, there's it outlines the history of how the warning was done, and then ends with, therefore, be it resolved by the select board of the town of Callis, one reimbursement notice of official intent, and then there's a paragraph about how we can spend money now and be reimbursed out of the bond on this project and then two cure of irregularities is just is a paragraph outlining some people think that front porch forum might not count we go through all this document the vote was good it was the intent of the select board it was the intent of the town why don't we 
just pull the question that was on the ballot, actually pull the question, shall the legal voters of Calais, blah, 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 and say that you guys attest to the vote of that, of that question on the ballot. What a great idea. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Well. Does anybody want to make that motion? Whatever that motion might be. Write it out, Rose, and then read it. <laughs> and, and yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine. And then I do think that at our next meeting, we need to pass this resolution that was written by the attorney. Because mm -hmm. that is not specifically addressing the three things that this resolution okay. outlines. So, um, yeah. say that again that for the next meeting you're going to, did you say ratify? Is that the word you used? Validate. I, I, let's, I think it's okay. Let's just do this at the next meeting. I will forward it to everyone now with a special note to you and Ann to put it on the okay. agenda and we'll do it next do time. It. Yeah. See. That's fine. Okay. Um, well if there are no further items, which I don't I, see. I have one thing to say and it doesn't have to be part of the meeting, it could be after the meeting. What do you say, Ann? Sure. Okay. I want to inform the select board that I, um, one of our neighbors had a burglary, um, and when we have that prior discussion about maybe people using drugs or impaired, um, I found it quite nerve-wracking. Um, I live on the corner of Lightning Ridge. I live on Lightning Ridge, Adamant Road. The top of Lightning Ridge, if you take a right, like you're heading down here towards Singleton Road, there's two really steep driveways, and the first one belongs to Casey, and I don't really recall his last name. Very steep gullage. Gullage. And did you hear about it? No. Yeah. And um, he has a big house and a separate garage, and he told my husband that about one in the morning, people were in breaking into his garage, and he got disturbed. And um, yeah, so they were, you know, trying to burglarize, and it was at like one in the morning, mm -hmm. and um, yelled to them, he got a shotgun, he shot a bullet straight up in the air, he scared him away. But it used to be that you felt like if you had a long driveway and you know you were kind of safe because people never knew what the exit route would be, that people more right on yeah. the road would be more at risk. But um, clearly, I mean, I found, I found it disturbing, you know, I mean. And long driveways are more tempting because they think people won't be there yeah. and they're going to have an easier way to access it. So anyway, um, it's increasing all over the Yeah, it's, it's so I just, you know, I mean, I don't hear too much about crime here in Dallas, but um, this is really close to my house and kind of freaking out. So, mm -hmm. you know, be aware. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. All right, and um, I forget, do we move to adjourn? Yep, okay. so moved. And second. second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. aye. All right.